Welcome to The Real Room, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, John Hinton, and you are in a real place for real people to have real conversation where we try our best to be relational, educational, authentic, and loving. Yo, shout out to everybody who is watching on YouTube or if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcast. However you're consuming your content, thank you for stepping in The Real Room and getting real with us. I am super excited. I'm really excited right now because oh, um, this is not a solo dolo. Yeah, no, we're not doing a solo dolo today. I actually have a guest who I've been waiting to get in the real room to come in here, sit down on this couch. We press record Ooh. and <laughs> or we close the door and press record and we're just going to get real. So I'm, I'm literally not going to wait, my guy. I, I've been waiting for this moment. So True. without further ado... I introduce and present to everyone, Jared Zimmerman. What's up, man? What's up, man? I did not even hear that, dude. What's up? I'm sorry. I, I got the I got the headphones oh, turned down, headphones, but it'll be on the recording for sure. Yeah, for like sure. everybody, everybody else heard the air horn. I'm just not cool enough. <laughs> What's up? That's what happens. All right, that, see, that's what happens though when we ain't got our headphones on. We're in here cold turkey chilling. We're just chilling. Because we have our wives off in the, the corner. The corner. Um, you guys can say hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that was oh so forced. Oh my gosh, right? Like, uh, <laughs> hi. Yo. It's like, it's so weird not to be, like, they're not on camera. So they, they literally could just interject at any point in time if they wanted right? to. Oh my gosh. All right. I love it. So, anywho, Jared, my guy. What's up? What's up, bro? How are much, you? man? I'm great, dude. Yeah. It's been a long time coming. You've been asking me to get on this thing for like six months, bro. Forever? Like Before literally? we even started it, man. I know. It's crazy. I know. It's, yeah. Oh my gosh, that has been six months. Yeah. That's crazy. I like it. Well, um, you, you've you uh, watched a little bit of our uh, podcast. Your yes, wife sir. is devoted to the lady episodes for real. Yeah, um, no. That's for sure, dude. I'm not even trying to like interject real quick, no, bro. Go but for it, she man. has watched so much more than I have. Yeah. I'm just being honest, man. She's like three full episodes in, and I'm like one solo of you, and then I got like 40 minutes of you and Pauline's episode, bro. I'm just gonna be honest with you. I'm sorry, bro. Yeah, but all right, but that's who you kind of are, though. Like you have a short attention span. Oh my gosh. Goldfish. Uh, just so everybody knows he's he's a goldfish. Squirrel. We got a goldfish. What? Yeah, bro. Facts. But uh, what's going to make this interesting is, though, I feel like you and I together, like we bring it out more in each no, other. Facts. So I really don't know <laughs> how this podcast is going to go. not going to talk about anything we're supposed to talk about. Bro, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, dude, I'm so happy to have you on the podcast today. And um, the reason I had I wanted you like specifically, uh, like, you know, I sent you the form. You filled out the form. Uh, because I like to know what my guests are coming in here and talking about or what they would like to talk about. Uh, because it can get kind of awkward us just sitting here staring yeah, right. at each other. Just like, like making so, weird eye contact. Uh, what should we talk about next? But um, yeah, uh, you know what we do here though. Uh, first and foremost, before we get into anything, because two, two uh, you know, short attention span guys could literally talk about anything, anything and be completely and satisfied in it while everybody else is like, why did I even click this video? Shoot. <laughs> like, but uh, I want to make sure that everybody who watches first and foremost has context to you. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can take as long as you want. You can be as detailed as you want. Um, I would like you to just first give people context to you and just share, share your testimony, bro. Share your life story. Shoot, where, no, I don't even. Start. So like, one day my parents met. No, I'm just kidding. Shared a milkshake, and bro. Right? Now I'm here. <laughs> no, I um. I don't even know where to start, man. It's conversations like this. This is why I wish my wife had a mic up next to her and she had the camera on her because she always helps me with this part because I'm like, hold on, what do I say next? And she's like, oh, this is what you say. Right. No, I, uh, shoot, I don't know, man. I, uh, I'll just put it this way. I've only been a follower of Jesus for about a little over two and a, two years now, about two years and like three months exactly, actually. It's not, right. it's, it's not been like, I'm not this crazy like seasoned Christian, man, but I tell you what, I uh, grew up in the church, though. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just start there. So I grew up, um, my parents were super, super young when I was born. Uh, my mom was, like, just turned 16. 
Really? Um, and my dad was 18 for a few months, youngins. I was at my I was at my dad's high school graduation. Yeah, man. What? That's crazy, I know. Okay. So, yeah, they, uh, they're just two young kids. Didn't really know what was going on with life, man. They were just kids. That's all it was. And So they're just babies having babies. Um, babies having babies. That's what babies. my grandma says. That's no, what my grandma it. Michelle says. Babies having babies, man. And so they were never together for more than a couple months after I was born. So I don't know what it's like to have them together in my oh, life. Okay. So, um, shoot, this is... I never see. You no, know, John was talking about the 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 goldfish man. I could go on a rabbit trail when I'm talking about this, bro. Listen, I am only Shoot. here to facilitate a place in which you can be real in, and you just go down whatever road you want, Shoot. and I'll just reel you back. You might not ever talk, then, bro. I don't know. What you Let's do it. So yeah, man. I uh, the first nine years of my life, I lived with my mom. Okay. Because like I said, my parents split, and uh, I mean that's usually how it goes with uh, custody cases, especially with young. Young adults, man, the the mom usually gets the case, even right. even if that's not how it should be. Um, so I lived with my mom for the first nine years of my life. Uh, I saw my dad every other weekend, and in the summertime, I was there for a week at a time. Right, and that that's just that's that was just my life, dude. That was just the dynamic I knew. That was what a my life was, and I remember uh, my grandma Teresa. She was a big part of my and my little brother's life um, because. Just to get to the chase a little bit, yeah. um, my biological mom, she, um, first of all, by the grace of God, she now has has turned her life around a little bit. Okay. Um, she is is free from the things she was struggling with. But when I was young, when I was in that age, birth to about nine years old, she um, slowly trickled into a really bad path of drugs. She got into a real bad drug addiction. Um, and to spare some details, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad, man. And there were some situations that my brother and I were in. Uh, my brother right now currently is 17. Um, at the time, I would have been like seven. He would have been like three, right? Like, dude's young. Dude was young when we were going through this stuff, even younger than me. So my grandma, Teresa, uh, my mom's mom, she played a huge role in uh, us as kids. She was there when my my mother was not. Um, so I remember many nights we spent down there at her house, um, so she, she, I, I created a lot of um, my initial introduction to Jesus to her, man, because she has always been a, a faithful, spirit-filled woman. And I remember, man, when I was, I, I can remember like vague memories of being five years old, and she would do Bible studies with me and read the word to me, and she'd be praying over me. I remember, man, I was, I don't know how old I was, dude, but I was, I was at her house, me and my little brother. He was like just in diapers at this time, man. And we're sitting there, and she's reading the Bible to me, man. And then, and then I was like talking to her about something. And all the, all, I don't know where she pulls this little bottle out of her pocket, man. And she puts this oil on her fingers, <laughs> and she rubs it on my forehead, oh, bro. Yeah, bro. She and was she, old school, dude. That's what I'm saying, dude. And it, it, the, the, the bottle had like, like a little crown as the lid, bro. It was like some old granny, oh, this like was royal, dude. Royal it was like oil, oil, oil royal bro. oil, crazy <laughs> stuff. And I'm like, yo, what is this woman doing? I smell like olive oil right now, bro. I smell, <laughs> <I'm> a, dude, <laughs> dude. <laughs> was she Italian? No, okay, she's not I was Italian, surprised. man. Bad joke. Actually, I guess. I don't know, maybe she is. I'll call after this pod. I'll call and we can confirm like, that. Are you Italian or were you uh, just part of royalty, dude? I was just royal, bro. From the young end, I was a, I was royal. I guess I don't even. I know. hear you, dude. So she, um, even when I had no idea what it meant, man, she was just kind of planting these seeds of Christ in my life, and it's crazy because I didn't even uh, realize that until so much later on in life. I say that like I'm like 70, bro. I'm still young, bro. But yeah, for context, how old are you? Uh, I'm actually I'm, I'm 29 and a half. No, you're nah, not. dude. I'm uh, <laughs> I just turned 21 two months ago. I'm a little pup, man. I don't even know how me and John are friends, to be honest, bro. He's like, hey, hey now. he's like 75, hey, hey bro. Now, bro. This guy. No, I'm 21, man. So I'm young. But I will say this: the stuff that I went through in life at a young age, it kind of caused me to mature quick. So I got you. A lot of people say, you know, you're you're wise for your age. You're an old soul, and I feel, you know. That's because of what I went through. Right. And so, anyway, man, I uh, when I was nine, I was about... Actually, you know what? It was August of 2014 is when I ended up moving in with my dad and my stepmom, who is... I call mom, who raised me from nine years old up, who is my mother, who danced with me at my wedding, who, you know, took me to all my proms. That's my mom. So uh, shout out to Aaron Zimmerly. I love you. That's my mom forever. And I don't know if she'll watch this or not. She's not a podcast person, but 
I love you. Maybe she'll watch this. One yeah, right. I'll text her and be like, yo, I shouted you out. No, so uh, I moved in with my dad and my mom when I was just about to turn 10 years old, man. And it was crazy because I went from seeing my dad every other weekend to out of nowhere. I never saw this man on Wednesday nights, but he was supposed to take me to an auction at the fairgrounds. And that wasn't even a lie. There was an auction going on. I remember this. I, I had this conversation with him. The the and the Allen County Fairgrounds, they were doing having some kind of auction or something. And right. me and him and my grandpa were supposed to go. But really, um, the courts had actually given my dad the 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 green light to take me out of the house. That's how unsuitable it was. Um, to the point where, like I'm talking, I'm eight, maybe nine years old, and and we'd like wake up in the middle of the night, like my mom was gone, bro. Like she just disappeared. Like yeah. I remember there was a time when me and my brother, a dude, dude, dude was in diapers for real. Like we had to walk down to my grandma's house at like one in the morning. We're like living in a not so nice trailer park in Lima right. and we're just walking down the street. I'm like, man, so stuff like that, like I didn't know wasn't normal. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're just existing. Yeah, dude. I mean, I'm you're just a child <laughs> not knowing the the situation or even the environment that you're in. How could you though, right? I mean, exactly. That that's exactly what it was. That was just normal to me. That was life and so when I uh, am supposed to be going to a uh, an auction with my dad, and I remember this, man. I, I don't think I'll ever forget this day. I uh, I get in the car, and at this time I had this little, like, prepaid flip phone. Right. And he took it and— uh, Gosh, I remember those. Dude, I don't know why homie phones, did it man. like this. This was, like, kind of traumatic. I feel like he should have okay. done it. Bro, like, bro just, like, he was like, hey, can I see your phone? Bro took the battery out of it and put it in the glove box. And I think that was probably a court order because I was not allowed to have contact with Tessa at all. Um, because that's, that's how bad the addiction was. It was to the point where all of the social workers, um, like they, they, they got with the judges and whatever. I don't know how all this legal process works and I pray I never have to know. Right. But, um, long story short, the Allen County judge had given the order for my dad to go legally take me out of the house. Um, like he picked Whoa. me up, he took me out of the house and shut my phone off. Tessa had no idea about the- Tessa is my biological mom's name for context. Okay. Took me out of the house, and she had no idea this was going on. So, dude takes my phone, and so I'm out in my dad, too, man. If he listens to this, man, he, I'm not dogging on him, man, but... No, dude, bro, I, I mean, you're in a situation dude. where some things popped off. Your mom's supposed to be with you, and Straight now she's up, not. Um, and, yeah. And then your dad comes in, and is like, hey, let me get your phone. Yeah. And then cuts separation, because, I mean, I, I could see it. Uh, like, I, I, I see, you know me, bro, I can imagine things. So I can see this whole thing like it's a movie and he's just trying to like cut that tie because who knows what she's on and what she might try to do when like you're her kid. But like, oh, they're trying to take my kid. She can freak out and like grab you and like run away with you. Yeah, that was uh, that's that's very true, man. I uh, looking back on the situation, there was a lot of stuff that went down that that through that process the next couple of years that she did that was exactly like that bro she was very she could be very manipulative man and she uh would just try to like feed stuff into my head and just make me very confused and it was hard bro um let me just hold on all right yeah no, we're gonna run off like- i'm about to just out myself real quick because pa- pastor lucian did it to me this morning at church look i'm just gonna give you a heads up i have tourette syndrome so if y'all <laughs> listen bro this is me this is the real room right we're, yeah, real. we're real so if you see me like doing like a little tick with my eyes one of these numbers right i'm like moving my eyes around or i'm adjusting my shoulders that's just me i got tourette's so as long as you don't like glitch out yeah right nothing, i just like, you know? saying, like swearing bro i'm so thankful like my tourette's is not that severe bro because right. i have known people so that you mainly just, like just got like a tick yeah, bro. Like, just a small, like one of these numbers with my eyes, like I'll, I'll have to like adjust my shoulders and stuff a lot. It's not like debilitating well, by any well, means. Well, you could just say it's the coffee. Like we have like Dude, two, right, two right. shots of espresso drink, in this thing. So this is like my third cup today too. So Gosh. no, that's actually a thing though. Uh, caffeine does not help my Tourette's at all, bro. And I'm a caffeine addict. So like that just is just how it goes, just to be honest. We're going to have to pray over him after this podcast. Okay. <laughs> All right, bro. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> anywho, anywho, so you're in the car. Dad grabs your phone. Yeah, yeah. Pops the battery out, throws it in the glove. Exactly, man. And so we go to. So keep in mind, I have a little brother. Okay. Uh, his is, name is Liam. He's with you at the time. Yeah. Uh, no, because we have different dads, man. Oh, that's a, okay. Oh my god, we go. we're getting layers. Bit, that's dude. There's so many layers. Um. So I have a, a younger brother. He's 17. His name is Liam. Liam. Okay. Separate dad than me. Um. But. He, so, oh man, I forgot about this part of the story. Um, So he had already 
been on a schedule of he saw his dad every Wednesday. Okay. So same same kind of deal, shared parenting. He saw his dad on every other weekend and on Wednesday nights. I forgot about that part of the story. So he was already with his dad. That right. was like a norm too. That was not like, you know, Wednesday nights, Liam's with his dad, whatever. Um, and so, man, this is a big part of the story. So my dad and Liam's dad, which, oh my gosh, this is about to get confusing. Ironically, his name's also Jared. So my brother's dad is also named okay, Jared. So, um, Jared Vieira. Okay. I'm just out in everybody. JV, we'll call him JV. JV, yes. Okay, JV, Jay-Z. Yeah. Okay. So, so him and my Jay-Z's, dad. Okay, go, go. Yeah. Go. So him and my dad, um, they were like working together with the courts. Obviously, because there's okay. two kids in this yeah. household, different dads. Oh, yeah. And mom's so acting on... a fool at the point. Exactly. At this point, like, we got to be responsible. Right, right. Exactly. Not calling her a fool, but she's just out here. No, so she, I yeah. guess. Exactly. Get so they're working together, um, and, and they brought us together. Like, they're, they're like my dad and JV were friends. Like, they've been working together for, like, two years at this point. Okay. To get us out of this household. And so they're friends. Um, and so, like, they bring me and my brother together, and they tell us together. And so, oh, dude, sweet. Yeah, so they, they were got super, open line of communication. And with you know, you two. exactly. And it's not and like they're trying to separate you. They're actually no. like, "Hey guys, and like to this, this day, bro, on. we have a good relationship." Like dude, just the God. other weekend, me and my wife went over to JV's house and saw Liam and the whole fam because that's they kept us in that relationship. So, thanks, kudos to my parents for that. But yeah, yeah, man. So they literally were just like, "Hey boys, you're not going to be going back to live with your mom," and we're like, "Ha, oh, you're funny," and right. I'm. And at this time, I'm nine, right? And Liam was. If he's 17, so if you're nine, he's he would five. Be five, yeah, five. I'm not good at quick math. In my no, head. You're good. I got you. Would have been five. And so, bro was like, he wasn't just cool with it. He's just like, whatever. Like, okay, yeah, cool. Because he's five. But I'm at, at the age where, like, I've been changing this dude's diapers when Tessa wasn't there for two yeah, years. Like, already. he don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. I'm a. <laughs> yeah. So, this is why I mentioned the Tourette's thing, because my neurologist said that this stuff that I went through as a kid is the reason that I have Tourette's because really Tourette's is a neurological disorder. And at a young age, I went through trauma, yeah. right? This I'll get into some more details. Yeah. It caused my neurological pathways to form quicker than they should have. Like my brain, the, my, my brain's ability to process difficult traumatic situations had to develop like that. Interesting. And so in that, um, that quick formation, these, those, that quick connection of my neurological pathways, there's just a little bit of a, a mishap there, and it caused my neurological system to not function 100% correctly. Therefore, I have Tourette syndrome. There's a little uh, anatomy lesson for you guys. I like it. So, like, you went through an experience <laughs> that caused a neural link to just like yeah. heart, like just go haywire and pop a fuse. <clears throat> That's essentially what it was, man. So. That's why I made I mentioned the Tourette's thing. And so they told us that, man. And yeah, dude, it was crazy. Like I was already started school that year, right before school started. So like I'd already been going to school for a week. And I hear like I'm never gonna go back to Tessa's house. I'm moving schools and I'm moving an hour away. I'm like, what? Oh, in a matter of a it's a Wednesday night, bro. Wait, so all right, so let me get this right. So I, I'm just trying to piece together the the story. So mm-hmm. dad comes and gets you. And then takes your phone away from you. And then where I'm missing a piece of the pie is they sat down and told you guys together. So did like your dad take you over to uh, the other Jared, your brother's dad's house? Yeah. And then they sat you both down. Yeah. Told you, hey, you're not going back home. Essentially, yeah. It wasn't his house, but it was um, his mom's house because it was really close. No, I got you. But But yes, just for reference, yes. They took us to JV's house. Um yeah, and they sat us down. And, like, as soon as my phone got taken, I'm starting to, like, be like, what? what's happening right now? I'm like, right. Dad, what's going on? And then we pull up to the to the, to the JV's house, and I'm like, I, obviously, I'm not going to an auction, bro. Like, what's going on? I'm starting to freak out. Dude, I flipped a switch. I, I like, when I, when we when they broke that news to us, man, they were like, you're going to, you know, live with us. I'm like, no, I'm not, bro. Like, you're crazy. Because my mo- my mother had painted my dad out to be this horrible guy that doesn't call yeah. doesn't want to see you, right? Because, you know, I mean, she's an addiction, man. She yeah. she was in addiction hard, um, really hard drugs. You know, I'll just be open. She she got addicted to heroin, man. She did. She uh, I'll, I don't want to tell her testimony for her, but long story short, she went through some stuff with some, some, um, some health problems, had some chronic pain, 
Got put on pain pills. Yeah, I mean, and that, that downward spiral turned into a, a heroin addiction for years. And so she was very manipulative. She was very um, condescending. She did a lot of stuff that was just not okay, man. And so she painted my dad out and my stepmom at the, you know, my mother, Aaron, painted her out to be th these horrible people that don't want to see me. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. They spent two and a half years in a, an abundance of money fighting court cases to get me in a safe home. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, in my head, I'm like, no, I don't want to see you, bro. I'm not living with you. So it was hard, bro. It was hard. It was a really hard couple of years, man. Like I was already in school for a week at Elida local schools. I was in fifth grade. And then, uh, on the snap of a dime, I never go back. I never see those kids again. I never see those teachers again. I start in a new school. I st in a new oh, home. Whoa! Like okay, yeah. like I moved, bro. Okay, so just for reference, yeah. Because I'm sitting here like wondering, like, did they just like you never went back to her house and then like? No, I didn't see her for like almost three years after that. So like you didn't going back and get like anything out of the house, like, nothing. no toy, what? Nothing, nothing, bro. Not a single thing. Yo, you're nothing. Oh my god. Yeah, it was, it was crazy, man. It was a crazy experience. Yeah, for a nine year old. I was nine, yeah. And you're completely ripped out of the only environment that you know. Mm -hmm. I didn't see them for, yeah, it was, Yo. it might have been, so it might not have been three years. Um, It was probably just under two years. I but still you. though. But like, everything yeah. changed. And, and literally in a day, like in, in 15 minutes, my whole life. So I'm going to a new school mm -hmm. with new people. I'm, I went from living in a small little trailer with my little brother, who was my homie, like we're we do everything, like, we're everything together. You know what I mean? Like that's all we got. Yeah, I mean, so you're living, changing the man's diapers, bro. Yeah, bro. <laughs> living in a house um, with three other kids, with the mom and a dad in the same household. I went to having to share a room, a bunk bed. I, dude, it's whole family dynamic, crazy man, like crazy. It was insane. Um, and so, all right, where are we at? Uh, you are dropped the news to us. Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah, dude, I started a new school, started like I whole new life, literally everything brand new. And for, um, I'd say about a year and a half, I was like really struggling. Like I'm struggling in the aspect of like, I'm still in a really new place. I'm unfamiliar. I'm insecure, like making friends and stuff. And at this time, dude, I was super overweight fat, like bad. And my, my wife's over here in the corner laughing, bro. This, why is she dogging on me right now? You were an ugly kid, so don't even say nothing to me, bro. <laughs> you did not. Bro, she had, man, if only I could post a picture of her kid, bro, when he was a kid, man. Bro, yeah. I, like right now I'm wondering, like I want to see like a childhood picture. Bro, of you. I was mom. a chub, I, Listen, I was a chubby kid too. No, John. No, like, I was chubby. I was nine years old and weighed 170 pounds. Okay, I don't think I was that chubby. Dude, I, I was, was chubby. Bad. I, like, was I was probably like a buck thirty. At, <clears throat> at nah, bro. 10, but I've never weighed a buck thirty in my life ever. Oh my bro, no, maybe when I was young and but when you were a baby, dude, right? Yeah. I was born at like ninety five pounds. Oh <laughs> my, stop it. <laughs> nah, bro. So, it, dude, it was a a long road, man. Because you got to think, blending a family like that, man, is so hard. I can it's only imagine. So hard because I had resentment. Because right. for years, I'm programmed to think that my dad didn't want nothing to do with me. But long story short, this man wanted everything to do with me, and my mm -hmm. mom was brainwashing me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, flip, the the script was flipped, man. Um, and then how do you process that? Like I don't I, even know how I process it You don't it have still. the mental ability at like nine years old to process nah, something that's, like that. That, that. That's the thing, bro. That's It was crazy, man. Dude, I like so, sometimes when I sit and talk about this, like I still... And marveling at like what I went through, bro. I'm like, I really went through that, bro. I got you. What? Well, if I could help you out in any any way, um, what I've learned at least, uh, when and this is from other people, and I've noticed it in myself. It's kind of like one of those things where, like, once you get the revelation or the right information that you need uh, to be able to achieve something, it's kind of like somebody finally put words to what I'm going through. You know what I mean? So if I could help you out in the least bit, at least if. You know, if anything, um, when you start like talking about this stuff, if you like start feeling things like if your body like it's, it's kind of like you're reliving it again. Mm -hmm. um, I've learned that it is a health or it's healthy. It's a health, healthy practice to allow your body 
to process that. Like, don't just try to like avoid like, nah, nah, I forgave them. I, I, I'm over that. I'm no longer nine. There's nothing I can do about that any longer, but it's actually like allowing yourself to process those feelings so that through processing those feelings, you might not even know it, but on a subconscious <clears throat> level, you might be, um, actually like overcoming and healing in some way. So yeah, a little cheat code for anybody who is maybe feeling some type of way when, they're trying to process a situation they went through that was very traumatic. Cause this sounds traumatic, bro. Dude, like, and I feel true. I feel traumatized <clears throat> listening to this. Cause I can only imagine that that's crazy that you say that man, because like I was just telling Riley this the other day, we were talking about just this whole situation in, in a nutshell. And like she, she said something along the lines of like, like, are you really have you really moved on though? Or some, do you remember this conversation? Riley, I don't know. She doesn't remember a lot of it's conversations like, we have. <laughs> Dude, we I don't know. She asked me that. She was like, Have you really moved on? Like, have you really forgiven her? And it, it took me back for a second. I'm like, hold on. Wait, have I? Wait, how much? And you know, I can say, yes. I have genuinely forgiven my biological mother for all that she put me through. I have. I have forgiven her. Part of me, st- there's still that little nine year old kid that went through what he went through. Right. But it's, but I don't harbor resentment, though. I don't harbor resentment, and I don't harbor unforgiveness. I can say truthfully, like, from my heart, I have forgiven her. But one thing that I haven't done a lot of is hashing out these emotions, man. And, and okay. talking about, like, what I really went through. And so it's not that talking about it brings up any... Uh, hatred or resent but it brings it just makes me really vulnerable man because this is a part of my life that is like that it's just it's just gone man that that part of my life it made me the man that i am like right now sitting on this couch in the real room but it's a part of my life that i just don't acknowledge anymore man i got you because I don't know, man. It's crazy. Hold on, bro. The Holy Spirit's kind of working on my heart. No, I hear you. I it's can like, feel him in this room, too, it's bro. Like I'm like, something what did you just do, God? <laughs> maybe that I should start acknowledging more. I yeah. should hash these emotions out because, bro, freedom in Jesus, man. Yeah. Like That's how- what I'm going to get to after all this, man. Like, dude, freedom in Jesus Christ. I don't have to worry about that past anymore because of Jesus, man. Yeah. So maybe I should talk about this more. Yeah. And thank you, Lord, for let's, that. Let's just be, let's be completely like real and honest with ourselves just because we don't have to deal with those things. Like, yeah, if you believe in Jesus and you found freedom and God has set you free from every sin, every bondage, I would start getting curious if you felt bound in some way or if you felt a way that does not feel free or like, why do I, when I think about past trauma or a past relationship or, my childhood do things start to stir up inside of me and if i feel some type of way while thinking about these things obviously i feel and believe that's god that's the holy spirit trying to get me to understand that there is things within me that are not fully resolved does that make sense like um yeah that's what i'm getting from it and i feel like a little cheat code for you, bro. Like you yeah, I'm curious, <laughs> man. Like it's it's almost like it's almost like when we come to Jesus, man, and we surrender these burdens and these chains, and, and we receive that freedom from that bondage. It's like we want to. It's like we want to write off what Jesus freed us from, man. It's like we want to. It's, it's like, bro, hold on. Oh my gosh, this might Let's be. It. It. Bro, it's it's like almost giving like discrediting our Savior, man. Because it's bro. Because listen. He died and rose from the grave so that I don't have to feel that pain anymore. Facts. So if I act like that part of me never existed, come on, bro, then it's like I'm not giving him the glory he deserves. Yeah, man. we're actually robbing him of bro, the grace. Exactly that because he gave to us. Like we're yeah, we're literally man. robbing ourselves of the testimony that he asks us to speak about. Like God doesn't say that we should ever feel shame or we should feel guilt. There is conviction. We know what conviction is. But, like, 
if when I'm speaking about my my testimony or my life for anybody who's not a Christian, uh, testimony is just literally your life. You're testifying to God's goodness. So if I don't give a full and honest testimony that I was a drug addict, that I was an alcoholic, that I was A, B, C, all the way to Z, if I don't acknowledge and, and speak these things truthfully, I'm literally robbing God of his goodness and his work in my life, right? I just want to I want to maybe correct you a little bit because I don't I don't I don't want to confuse anybody who maybe is not a Christian and heard you wrong. I wouldn't say you're robbing him of his goodness because his goodness and grace doesn't oh, no, change. I, yeah, no, I, I would you. say you're robbing him of the glory he deserves for his goodness. That part. Okay. And, I stand corrected, yeah. good sir. Just be just, just for that clarity because no, I hear you. because even right now, if I were to turn away from God and I would say, you know, I got out of that situation on my own. That this is not the truth. I'm saying that as if right now, this hypothetical. Right. I got out of the situation on my own. It wasn't God who saved me. And I, I turned around and I walked away and I I never pursue Jesus again. That doesn't change that he loves. He still loves me. Facts. That doesn't change that he's still good and he's still the Alpha and the Omega. Facts. So in this vulnerability, not only, you know, with the real room and just anybody that you may encounter with your testimony, yep. you you heal yourself. And it reminds you, my God really is that good, man. Mm-hmm. He's really that good because because the the stuff that I went through and let me just I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump a little bit forward in my testimony and start talking about some yeah no you're good you're um good. i mean you went through what so we have up until nine then you went through some things within your life yeah yeah a man. hard transition so, yeah and... so i grew like i grew up from nine to you know i would say about freshman year uh, my parents were like dude looking back i i can't even thank my parents enough for all the stuff they did man all of all of the times where like I would, you know, maybe I'd argue with my parents and I'm thinking, man, like, why are they, like, why, why are they acting this way? Or why is it not going the way I want it to go? Or, you know, I'm disagreeing with my parents. I'm looking back on the situation and some, some of the things that we went through as a family, it's like, bro, they were just, they're trying to figure it out, man. Right. They were just trying to figure it out. They literally Kids spent, raising kids. Dude, exactly. <laughs> they spent so many years, so much energy and effort and time and so much money, man, trying to give me a better life. They're just trying to figure out how to do it. And so I look back on the situation. It's like, well, well, why did my parents do it this way? It's like, because they were they were confused too, man. They were hurting too, man. They were broken too. And so they did every everything they knew how to raise me up in a way that a child should go, you know, as the Bible would say. We, you know, like they took us to church in the youth group. We would do Bible studies together as a family. And and we, you know, I was active in my youth group going to Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and events and concerts, all the, all the whole nine, man. And so I was raised in, in that kind of, you know, atmosphere, right? right? Like I knew of Jesus and I knew of the faith. And when I was younger, I really did, you know, try to pursue it. And I would say that I knew who Jesus was. I, I would say that I, I never truly gave my life to him. Right. But I knew I knew who he was, and I I knew hypothetically what he had for me, um, but I was just an, an uninformed kid, man, mm-hmm. and I was just in a situation that was hard for everybody, not just for me, man. And so, I'd say about freshman year, I don't know what caused it, but we slowly like trickled out of the church. We slowly, you know, we'll go like every other Sunday, and then oh, if we miss like three Sundays, it's okay because we were you no, know, we we're on a camping trip and we were spending time as a family, and and slowly we faded away from going to church as a family. Um, we we kind of walked out, walked away from that, and I stopped going to youth group and stuff. And you know, I can, I, I, I really can say this. I don't know what the cause of that was. Um, I know that you know, parents go through hard stuff. I mean, I'm not a parent, but. I have come to the point in my life where my parents and I have a relationship that we can talk about some stuff like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is uh, this this certain topic is something we've never talked about. But l- analyzing the situation, I'm I'm just gonna make the assumption they were probably just going through it, man. That right. there's been some so many things they've went through, and um, so I don't really know what the reason was, but we faded out of church. Okay. Um, and I really this this is where the testimony gets kind of. Juicy, bro. Oh, well, let's hear it, man. Dude, as if it wasn't juicy enough, man. I really started just walk. I started walking away from like faith in general. I was like, I don't care about this Jesus stuff, man. Like, this is, I'm good. Um, and so you're how old when you're about when you're saying, yeah, I'm good. How old are you at this time? I'm gonna say I was 14 when okay. I really started make so. 
I was 14. Oh, look. Here's this. Can't, thank you for that, Holy Spirit. I was 14 <laughs> years old, man. And I remember there was this kid, two kids, that I was going to youth group with. Right. These kids, like, I'd known them for a while, and we'd been going to youth group together. Um, and so they're, uh, you know, they're kind of my friends or whatever. And I, I kind of only knew them in the youth group setting, right, in the church mm-hmm. setting. Um, but then uh, there was a time I, you know, I hung out with them a little bit outside the church, outside the youth group. And I, the true colors are showing, man, and I'm, like, kind of seeing, like, they don't, they don't really, like, walk with Jesus, man. So I'm 14. These two are 15. And then we're with um, some older kids. Um, names are irrelevant, but one kid was 17. One kid was 16. My other two friends were 15. Yeah. And I was 14. And we're hanging out outside. So you're of, the youngest. Yeah, I'm the youngest. Okay, man. so you're the youngest. Yeah. Um, we're hanging out outside the youth group for the first time. And, bro, they're, like, showing me true colors, man. Like, they're pulling out, like, some cigarettes. They're like, bro, we can smoke a cigarette. I'm like, whoa, what? Are you kidding me right now, bro? Like, we're about to go to youth group tomorrow. Nah. It, I'm going to so, feel so convicted. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to be at the altar again. <laughs> bro. Nah. For, <laughs> dude. That's a whole rabbit trail. Don't even Oh, come me. on, bro. Let's bro. Sorry. Tell me. And so, dude, just to cut to the chase, man. I was 14 years old the first time I smoked weed. Okay. Wait. All right. So, they had. So, I'm with these friends, bro. Yeah. My church friends, and it got me to smoke weed when I was 14, bro. Outside, like, we're hanging out for the first ever time outside of church. Yeah. And my parents thought these kids were good kids. They're like, yeah, Jared's been going to youth group with them for all this these years. And my dad knew him because he helped us in the youth group. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, you can go hang out with these kids. And, bro, they got me high, bro. I'm like, I didn't even know we were doing this. I didn't want to do it. They were like, hey, bro, we're doing this. And I'm like, eh. They're like, yeah. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, bro. I was 14, bro, and they just got me all high, bro. I'm like... <laughs> Dude, like, just, just on a real I'm, note. I'm not laughing. I'm just, no, you're good. It's, bro, like, bro, oh, like, kids I, are kids, man. Dude, don't oh, even say that, bro. Kids, gosh. that shouldn't be how kids are, no, though, man. No, it shouldn't, but I'm I was just 14, saying. and they're, like, handing me bongs and handing me a blunt, and we're just, <laughs> I was so high, bro, and it, it just scarred me. And for, like, literally, that was oh, a, yeah. that was I mean, a turning point. the first time you got high. First time I got high, so like I'm I literally, sorry, I'm painting a picture here. I feel bro. like you're in a back alley somewhere, <laughs> bro, but you're, like. Bro, you know what's funny is his backyard was, like butted up to an alley uh, so listen we walked out of this dude's old like victorian style house he has an old like 1900s garage that was like built for like a model t right and the back window is kind of broken out so we're standing out behind his garage on this fire pit man yeah dude it was crazy it was too in the back in the back alley john hit that nail on the head it's not me god's giving me pictures bro i'm like <laughs> painting this in my head <laughs> so dude. you're 14 and you're hanging out with a few friends they're all older than you you're the youngest you're just like they're just bad influences. Who are supposed to be my they're church supposed friends? To be church, right? I mean, they are your church friends. Yeah, yeah. They just, uh, I mean, hypothetically <laughs> knowing who God was and knowing what He's done, but not really. I wouldn't say comprehend. I wouldn't say fully comprehending. Like y'all just ain't living it, right? Like you're not just living. It. You're just not living it. You're your yeah. kids. That's why I said kids being kids. Like yeah, we know who G- or we heard Jesus. We heard all these little stories uh, that you're telling us in youth group, but it hasn't. The seed hasn't, you know, sprouted yet. Right. Yeah. So yeah, man, that was like my turning point when I was like, hold up, man, I might. I might want to go hang out with these kids, man. Right. I, I, I don't. Got these me church high. kids are kind of lame, bro. And so, like, and here's the funny thing: you ready for this, bro? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. That I'm was here. on like a weekend, right? Like a Saturday night. Maybe it was Friday, because the next day we woke up and my parents wanted me home because we're gonna go out of town as a family or something. And I was like, no, like let me stay. Like I want to stay with my friends, bro. Like let me stay, hang out. Like why? What's so important? I'm like, oh, we're going to so and so's house. I'm like, who's so and so? And I'm like, oh, um, oh yeah, he's not in the youth group. Hold on, let me. So I'm trying to explain to my parents why they should let me hang out with these kids. And I get home, and they're like kind of suspicious about it. And discernment. Yeah, dude, I was acting all listen, weird. I probably was too, Loki. Listen, teens, your parents know. Dude, they know. <laughs> they do. They aren't stupid. I'm telling you right now because my parents just saw something was off with me, bro. They really did because they're like asking me about like what we did real in detail. Like, oh, so what'd you do? And I like just drilling into me bro and something didn't make sense to him i guess bro and so yeah long story short they're sus about it the next weekend i asked to hang out with the same kids i don't know what the reason was but they like they asked for my phone and they're just kind of going through my phone which is like 
at the time, I'm like, bro, like you're invading my privacy. I'm like, dude, they bought the phone. They're paying for the phone. They think. So I'm like, all right. Looking back, I'm your like. Your parents I'm, are going through your phone. Yeah. I'm glad they went through my phone because it. Uh, anyway, bro. They went through my phone and found some text messages about what we were doing. They're like, so what did you do last weekend? I'm like, yeah, so-and-so. And they were like, what's that? Really? Say? And I was like. <laughs> Set up. <laughs> oh, yeah, we did do that. Oh. So then they caught Sorry, me. Sorry, I killed the brain cells that remembered that. Yeah, right? <laughs> week later, they caught me. I was grounded for a while. And as soon as I got off grounding. Wait, wait they caught you? Or yeah. like. Yeah, the bro, text messages in, was yes. the caught? Or, okay, yeah, I thought, bro. like, well, no. you said a week later, so I'm like, did you go hang out with so them again, week, and then they caught you? A week you? later, they looked through my phone. Got you, okay. And they caught me. Okay. Grounded, whatever. I get off grounding, and I'm like, dude, I'm changing my life around, bro. I'm not doing this no more. I'm done. I'm going back to youth group, and it lasted like three weeks, bro. <laughs> three weeks. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> the turnaround rate is ridiculous. <laughs> bro, it was maybe, maybe a month, bro. Oh gosh, so, bro! I did the same thing growing up, man. I was yeah. all that to say, bro. Late for sure, dude. For sure. That was like the point in my life where I like started walking away from the church and Jesus, man. And over the next four years of high school, I just got rowdier and rowdier, dude. I just yeah. I stopped caring what my parents said. I kept smoking weed. Like I lost my virginity when I was like just freshly 15 years old bro like i was so young it was so oh, bad it was just horrible situation man right um oh you're out here walking in the flesh bro man. so I mean, bad like and it's just dude i look back on these situations and it's like bro what was i doing you weren't thinking if i ever have a kid that was like me bro i don't want to be a dad bro that's crazy <laughs> i was a Dang, bad was a kid bad. dude like and i got away with so much i got away with so much more well, yeah because when you're being bad with strict parents i mean definitely holy spirit filled parents who tried to raise you right yeah like you got to get good at hiding stuff let's be real. i was too I was really good at hiding stuff, bro. My uh, why she's uh, my wife's over there making a face at me, bro. I might get to that part of the testimony later, bro. We um, dude, I was crazy, dude. Like it got yeah. to the point where, dude, once I got my license, bro, it was oh, yeah. game, it's all over. game over, yeah, dude. Freedom. That's a whole nother level of freedom. Game over. I started smoking weed a lot, man, like a lot, a lot, to the point where like, there was like a, a good like year and a half of my life where like. My norm, like my my normalcy, was high, bro. Like if I wasn't high, I felt sick. Like I'm off. I'm, like I'm serious. Like I'm like wake up. Like I'm getting up for school, bro. Like I'm going to go to the high school, bro. And I'm sitting in the high school parking lot, just freaking, just ripping dabs, like all day, every day. Like that's how good I was. And my parents never knew, bro. I feel like they knew low key, but they just never like I don't know. Looking back. Looking back, I feel like they knew because, like, one time my dad found some eye drops in my in my glove box, and I told him it was because of my contacts, bro, because they had just got me contacts. I'm like, they're bugging my eyes, bro, and he's like, these are redness eye drops, not re-wetting eye drops, and I'm like, I didn't know what to buy. I just got these. He was like, all right. They I'm make my trusty. eyeballs feel good. Yeah, yeah, right, bro? And I don't know, man. I look back I at it. I'm like, how are my parents so Our naive? Our are rolling over here. Dude, they're dying, too. They are. <laughs> Riley's over here like, why did I marry this guy? No, dude. So I just, dude, I was just making some poor choices. Right. Um, and dude, like closer to my senior year, bro. Oh wait, no, this was junior. Okay, it was junior year. Yeah. Junior year of football season. I I'm like I got this spot on varsity, right? Um. Varsity football. I got the spot because. Here, here comes like back to the full circle a little okay, bit. Okay, let's get it. The, the one of the same friends. When I was 14, that like got me high for the first time. Yep. Started selling me Adderall when, when I was like 17. So before football games, like, I mean, for those that don't know, maybe you're like a little, you're ignorant to this topic, which is probably a good thing. If you don't have ADHD and you take Adderall, it wires you up. Yes. It it's does. like if you don't have ADHD, it's the equivalent of like doing Coke. Like, oh yeah, dude. It, it's it's straight up. Oh yeah. So like before Popping football capsules, games, crushing it down. Yeah, dude. Up your nose. It's literally cocaine. Just D because medical so, grade. Exactly. Adderall um, is an amphetamine, and amphetamines are like ninety percent of what makes up cocaine. Yeah. So more or less, I'm a seventeen year old who's like out on the varsity football field, and I'm I essentially just did coke before the game. So like I say this like in a humble way because I look back and I'm like I was like. 
It was stupid, but like I was like getting really good. I can make every field goal ever. <laughs> Give Bro, me like, the ball, listen, coach. I was like, real, I was like doing really <laughs> no, good. I got you. <laughs> because like, there's a reason why you can't do drugs and sports. Like, yeah, exactly, bro. Because I'm I'm taking Adderall, bro, like way more than like even for someone that has ADHD. Like I'm taking so much more than I should have been taking, bro. Oh, so yeah. like I'm like I'm on the football field, like I'm not missing tackles, I'm bro. Hyper I'm hyper focused, bro. That's what it does. It like takes your brain and like everything else outside of what you're focused on bro is so yeah. irrelevant it's crazy it's a no, weird I experience you. i was a drug addict I know. and <laughs> yeah john knows about it and so yeah dude i started doing that and first it was like all right i'm doing it before friday night football games mm. that's it i'm going crazy yeah. setting boundaries being and then, responsible with our drugs bro right? drug responsibility dude and then i remember this one time it was a saturday it was a homecoming weekend, bro. And there was this girl that I went to school with. Um, and she was having a little get together at her house. We're supposed to be like, yeah, a couple of people. We're going to sit and we're going to play beer pong and hang out. bro. Like everybody showed up to this party, bro. Yeah. So many people showed up to this house and we're just being crazy, stupid kids. And, and this said girl, she also had a bunch of Adderall. She was like, you want to try someone? I'm like, ah, I only do that on Fridays, dude. That's not, that's my Friday drug. You're not respecting my boundaries. Yeah, right, bro? <laughs> And then long story short, man, that, that Saturday night, I took, I took an Adderall, um, and this girl was like severely ADHD, so it was really high milligrams. And so like, I took one and I was just, you know, it, the effects were there, yeah. but I was also smoking weed and I was also drinking alcohol. So mm-hmm. I'm like, I need more of this. Yeah. So then, you're bro. You're unbalanced, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? You're teetering, I'm like, bro. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm uppers and downers. I'm in up a second. one minute, down another one. And so then. It was crazy, dude. And so they start snorting this stuff. And I'm like, all right, why not? So, like, I'm over here, like, first time they showed me how to crush a pill. They showed me how to line it up. I'm snorting this Adderall, dude. And oh, that's that was like the turning point. That's yeah, when I was like, I bet it was. Oh my gosh, bro, this is so much better than just Friday night. So I'm talking like I'd have like two pills on my wallet, and I'd like be at trade school. I'd you know stop I my need mas- to focus, stop my <laughs> machine that I'm running, like heavy machinery equipment. I go to the bathroom, like oh, I have to go take, I have to go take a number two. No, I'm just taking Adderall in the bathroom. <laughs> I'm just in that bathroom taking Adderall, bro, and I go back to class and. Let me tell you something though. I was like killing the grades though, bro. I was getting A's on all the Listen, tests. Listen, bro. There's a reason why college students do this for studying, bro. Because like, it that makes you hyper focused. Crazy. Like, listen, these things like I'm not saying drugs are good. No, drugs are not. I'm not. I'm saying not drugs glorifying are good. this life. I'm not. We're not. But we're being real about it. And if I want to be completely honest, uh. With any teenager that ever listens to this, there is a purpose for drugs, just like there's a purpose for everything we do in life. It's just the abuse, and that's just the abnormal use of drugs. So you can do something like Adderall if you like need it. If you are prescribed Adderall, if you're prescribed a drug for a reason— responsibly, you are to take this. But like, if you— abnormally use it if you abuse it of course there's going to be bad effects and like but the thing is is like at the time i didn't see it as a bad effect though i'm like dude this is making me lit bro like i'm acing my tests i'm killing it on the football field i'm having fun you're justifying it exactly man and so that that was like a weird point man where i'm like i'm I'm, that was like my introduction to like a new group of people man where it was like I was with this group of friends and we would like, you know, we'd throw a couple of beers back and we'd smoke weed. But then I'm like with these people, these other, this other group of friends. And it's just like even more crazy, bro. Like I, I started, I, I started doing some Coke too. Like, like the Adderall wasn't enough, I guess. And they're, and they're you know, trying to justify it. Like, well, like the, the Coke is pretty much just like the Adderall. And I'm like, is it though? Because you got that from a doctor and you got that from some guy behind your house in an alley. Right. Is it really the same thing? Nope. But eventually I did it, though. Mm-hmm. I started snorting coke. Um, yeah, dude, that was crazy. I would, like, just to think back about the fact, like, there was a point in time in my life where, like, I would, li- I was literally, like, doing cocaine. Like, it was, like, normal. What? So I just want to draw this, this picture because I just, the Holy Spirit, like, lined it up for me. And this is for all the people who want to like really be that that guy or be that person who says that weed's okay weed's fine 
Weed's not a gateway drug. I talked about this with Oyama on his podcast, and he admitted <laughs> weed is a gateway drug. So you had weed at 14, smoked weed at 14, and um, you were getting high here and there. Next thing you know, the same dude that's, that, that gave you weed for the first time now gives you Adderall, and now Adderall leads to cocaine, and you're drinking and doing all this <laughs> stuff around it. Like, sounds like weed's an Adderall, or weed is a gateway drug. And, bro, and that's the thing. Like, honestly, thanks for saying that because, like, I knew that, but, like, that's something I almost don't even acknowledge a lot is, like, I was this innocent 14-year-old kid who got high, and then, like, three, four years later, I'm doing coke right. a lot. And I, I, almost, I almost never would want to attribute those two together, but you're right. No, it is. You're when so I, right because— from, from somebody—I'm sorry. I don't want to— Bro, I just burped into the microphone. <laughs> no, I'm so right. sorry, bro. <laughs> if this is the real room, I'm going to be real. I just hey, ripped bro, a burp. we are real people with real bodily functions. As long as you're not, like, trying to <laughs> rip a fart or nothing in my microphones, I'll be fine. But no, all right, so the reason I say it, though, I just want to be honest about it because a lot of people who aren't honest are the ones who are trying to justify why they should be doing it. And I think there there can be a purpose for marijuana. I really do. But not if you're trying to abuse it and justify why you need to use it. Like, I'm someone who used to smoke a lot of marijuana. I was a pot. No. What? I, yeah, bro. John, Are you what? telling me a Christian used to be a, no. a drug addict? Yeah, bro. I you're smoked a follower a, of Jesus. Bro, listen. I smoked a lot of weed. I can't believe we're, we're talking about this. Oh, my God. Well, you do not, have you not talked about this on the pod? I don't think we really talked about, like, drug drugs. Like, I haven't even told my, like, full testimony. But, um, dude, I was a drug addict. And for the longest time, I would not want to contribute uh, weed or, like, connect weed with being a gateway drug but it is you want to know why and the word of god says it the word of god says that we should remain sober-minded so if anything if you take anything that takes you out of your sober mind state and makes you weak-minded or agreeable then it's bad yeah like it's literally bad It, it puts you in a position where you're not able to make uh educated and wise decisions so by that definition, bro, it's a gateway drug. Like, it's something that lowers your willpower to say no. Right. And, and also, too, like, not so I, I fully agree with what you just said. And and I will also say that, well, okay, let's be super cliche really quick. Come on. You know, like, you give, you, you give an inch, they take a mile, right? Mm-hmm. So the Bible also says not to give the enemy a foothold. Facts. So if you are justifying, you know, well, smoking weed, like it's natural, it grows from the ground, or like God created the heavens and the earth, he created weed, and and I've heard this so many times, bro. You're not wrong. God did create it. He put he it did. on earth. But God also created grapes, and God also created humans who cultivated wine, right? And, and, and God also says to not be drunk on wine in excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come on. So this, the, the fact of the matter is this. If you justify that it's okay to smoke weed because it's not a gateway drug, it's super light. Or I and, use and it for my back. Yeah, or, right. I got back pain. It helps me and, focus when I study. Yes, I can't. It helps me sleep. No, no you have a you, problem. Whatever, whatever you use. That's the truth. It. If you're justifying that, it's going to be a lot easier for you to justify the fact that when somebody comes up and says, hey, man, this Adderall is really going to help you get better grades, and you're like, you know, like I'm, I'm trying to follow Christ and I'm, I'm doing really bad in college and I don't want to disappoint my parents. Maybe I'll, I'll justify that. But if you've already given your, given the enemy a foothold to, yeah. to, to help you justify that smoking weed's okay. Or like a toehold turns into a foothold. Yeah, exactly. And Thank that you. And foothold turns into bondage. Yeah. And then when there's bondage, now you're in a stronghold. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I'm not, I'm not sitting over here preaching. This, these no, are cheat preach codes. Listen, these Preach. are cheat codes. Like here in the real room, we give cheat codes to life. And what you're going to get from me is Bible. And I might not be able to quote it correctly, or like I might not be one somebody that can bring it up verbatim, verbatim mm-hmm. but I'll give you the JHT, this John Hinton translation. <laughs> oh my. And I'll tell you, listen, there is wisdom. God has given us wisdom. And um, I love how you said it. Like, yeah, he did create it. God, God did create it. And he said it was good. He also created it for a purpose. Mm-hmm. Now, 
uh, he is the one who is to tell me that purpose. Right. Amen. And he does give me wisdom. He does give me understanding. He does give us intelligent human beings the ability to find good reasons to use good things that he created. But if I love how you say, if you give an inch, you take a mile. There's a reason why the devil was a snake in, in the book of Genesis. And then if you look in the book of Revelation, now he's a dragon. It's because we gave Come the on. devil an inch. Come and on. now he's done, took a whole mile and a half. Come on. And now he, the enemy of our soul, wants to use anything, including the good things of God, to pervert our lives and our understanding of our purpose. Come on. Bro, it's like one of the, one of the biggest deceptions and lies the enemy will feed you is the deception of believing that you are following Christ and that you are abiding by his will when you're not. Ooh, because the enemy, yeah, the, the enemy, look, if the, if you're already deceived and, and, and you think you're following Christ and you're not, the enemy's not going to come at you with all the, bro, so like, let me explain myself. The enemy wants you to think that the, the will of God and the purpose of God is to is to keep you bound, right? He wants you to think that what God has for your life is restrictive. Oh yeah, right. Like God no doesn't fun. want me to party. God doesn't want me to sleep outside of marriage. God doesn't want me. So He wants you to think about all the don'ts and right. Uh, right? So he, He's gonna trick you into thinking, well, I'm abiding by His will. It's like because you know He put this plane on Earth, and God mm -hmm. said it was good, and I can smoke. And and you know, not to get on a rabbit trail, but at the end of the day, man, if we give the enemy a toehold, it becomes a foothold into a stronghold, right? Yeah. Man, where, where, how do we get on this, bro? I don't know. How do we? I feel like the Holy Spirit came in the room, that's, and I just, been I just reacted to him, bro. <laughs> so, all this being said, I'm gonna wrap back to my testimony. Yeah, okay? absolutely. So, all that being said, I was 17. I started doing some coke, um, and man, you said the room gets some silent pauses sometimes, right? Man, yeah. I'm gonna make it awkward. Take your time. Be comfortable in the pause. Bro, all of the choices that I made, all of those horrible things that I did to my body and to others, man, the enemy wanted me to think that that was okay. So, like, to wrap back around to what we were saying about the weed, man, and, and giving a, a toehold and a, a foothold, like, for so long, I was, like, trying to justify it, man. I was trying to justify it like it's dude like it's just weed bro like it's okay like i'm not i'm not out here shooting heroin i'm not out here you know like getting slaughtered drunk and driving around and killing people i'm just sitting around with my friends in a lawn chair by a fire smoking blunts it's okay i'm not harming anyone and so like i, I, I dude i would try, try to justify it constantly i'm like it's, it's okay dude it's cool like i'm not hurting anybody there's no problem with it and that's what the enemy does, man. He makes you, he he tries to get you to believe that your sin isn't hurting you. Mm -hmm. But it was, dude. It was it was ripping me apart, man. It was it was killing me. And and the fact that the matter is is when I gave my heart to Jesus. So so I was at that point in my life, and it, it just drug on like that. Yeah. You know, I graduated high school. I moved out of my parents' house. I moved in with my grandma because I had got this really nice job. And that's another testimony, bro. This job that I have, I'll talk about that in a little bit when it comes to my. You know, oh no, I got you. Whatever. That's one of the reasons why I wanted you on the podcast. Is why? Uh, you're a blue collar worker, bro. Yeah. You literally, and we're gonna get into it, but that was yeah, one man, of those we reasons. got a lot to say, don't we? Yeah, we do, bro. But we're I mean, doing good. We're you, making bro. good. Time. Thanks for having me on the real room, dude. Oh yeah, this thanks for being here, bro. So I graduated school, high school, moved in with my grandma and my grandpa. Okay. Um, I went into to Rhodes State College. I was doing this internship. And I had all this freedom, bro. Like, keep in mind, my mindset's still the same. Like, I'm still living in my flesh, but I have so much more freedom. Like, I don't have to answer to my parents. I don't have to ask them if I can leave. So when I graduated high school, bro, it got worse. Because, like, I, all that restriction was gone. Like, I don't have to, hey, hey, do you guys care if I go here and here? Yeah, sure. Do, do you, I'm going to be gone. Can you leave the house unlocked? No. Like, I had a key to my grandma's house. She was like, you're an adult. You're going to learn a responsibility. I'm not your mom. Like, just, you know, like, oh, I helped out with groceries a little bit, whatever. But, like... And so I had all this freedom, bro. And so I'm just like, bro, like it went from like, I'd, I'd smoke weed during the week and on the weekends I drink and do some coke to like during the week, bro. It's like, it's like a Tuesday night and I got to be up for work at like 5 a.m. And I'm like at my friend's house at 1130, like over here, like three bowls deep. And I'm like passing out on this couch. Like it got bad. 
to the point where it's like, I'm, I'm not in school anymore. I, got, I have an actual job, like a big boy job, you know, quote unquote, big boy job. Mm -hmm. And I'm still doing it, bro. I'm still out here doing this crazy stuff. And, and, and you know what hurts my heart? Whoa. Sorry. You know what here, hurts my... Favor. Like, move this mic in a little bit. Yeah. Like, go ahead and grab the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, grab the table. Oh. And then move it in this way. Okay, okay. Hold up. And then lower it. No, lower this. Yep. Yeah. There you go. There Thanks, you go. John. I got you. So... What really breaks my heart, man, is is realizing the fact that, you know, that was it's close to four years later. I'm you know, I've been walking with Jesus now. And as I've gotten to be interpersonal and connected with guys at my work, man, I realize that there's guys that really still live that. Right. Like they're 25, 30, 35, and there's they, that's how they live, bro. Yeah. Like it's they're not weekend warriors, my guy. Bro, it's not abnormal for them to live like that. Bro, and so so I was living reckless dude like i'm trying I'm trying to work this job you know be responsible and i'm still out smoking and partying and you know all this stuff so i was in a really unhealthy relationship now here, here's the good part guys here's the the turnover this oh, is when this it. is when jesus comes in bro. all right this is when jesus comes in all right so we got all that context yes a little bit of your childhood yeah and also raised. look i just want to say this too like if there's any listeners like and I, I just say this from like an honest, humble heart. Like I'm not trying to like if anybody can relate to what I just said, bro, or like if you want to talk about that, bro, like I'm I want I want to be open about it. Because yeah. there's people that I have met in my own life, like who I've been able to share some parts of that with, man. And like it just I'm gonna I'm at, I'm able to connect with people and like so if you like want to talk about that, bro, like you can reach out to me, man, because like I am a very open person. You'll realize that. Like you if you haven't already. Yeah. I'm so open, bro. So like if you like have a question, bro, like you I'll I'll give you any answer you want. So just for that context, like any listeners, like if you want to hear more about my past, man, let's talk about it cuz I know I'm probably not the only one that has gone through that situation. Oh, absolutely. That's but, what the real room's for, man. Dude, I'll yes. make sure I'll I'll actually make sure to uh drop your social links in bro, look, the description do below. So if I'm you want to reach man. out to him, I'm 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 going to put that in the description all I got is Facebook. I'm just saying. Hey, I don't do Instagram. I don't do Twitter. All that. I get. I, I get on Facebook once a week. Some people only got a flip phone. Bro, I can get a hold. Of you, I tried to buy matter. a flip phone, but my wife said no, bro. She said that she would be embarrassed. You are to be legitly a 30 year old in a 21 year old's body. I, bro. I don't care. It's crazy. There's a reason we're friends. It's Dude, so you're right. Nice. All so, right. Anywho, listen. So man. that went on for about a year and a half. I was in this really unhealthy relationship, man. So I'm just gonna keep it real. The wife already knows this story, so we're comfortable. I can talk about this. Um, this girl that I was dating, bro, like, we started dating literally just because, like, like we it was like a one-night hookup. Gotcha. Like, it was just like, let's just, like, you know, like, fool around. And then I was, like, at that time, like, I was not in a relationship, whatever, and I'm just like, you know what? Cool. Like, let's just date or whatever. You know what I mean? Let's just date. It was so bad, bro. So unhealthy. Like, in the back of my mind the whole time, I'm like, I don't actually want to date this girl. <laughs> like, I really low-key don't. But, like, she has really good weed, and she just wants to sleep with me. Oh, my bro, God. Bro, like, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Like, this is the real room. Let's be I, real. I got you, bro. This I is, got dude, you. This is pre-Jesus Jared, man. Like, I was like, bro, that's the truth. Hey, listen, standards are low before Jesus. Facts, bro. Like, that's, like, the way I saw it was I never had to pay for my weed anymore, and I was just living. Right. So I'm in this relationship. It's bad, bro. Yeah, bro. Listen, there's probably people out here in relationships for less. That's the truth, though. I'm just saying. That's the truth. Um, so I'm in this relationship, man, and I would say it was about three months in. Mm -hmm. No, dude, the Holy Spirit started doing something, man. So I, I don't have a testimony where it's like somebody shared the gospel with me and I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? This guy wants to save me? No, bro. Like I had already had all this background knowledge. Yeah. Like I grew you up in the, church. in the church. Yeah. I knew about all of it, bro. I knew Jesus loved me. And so the Holy Spirit just starts convicting me, dude. Out of nowhere. I'm talking like, Johnny, you might not even know this about I me. I don't. For real. I'm in She knows this. this. The wifey knows this. Right now. Dude, like I'm talking like, okay, let's keep it real. All we, me and this girl, like, slept together. I felt horrible about it. I'm like, I don't want to do that again. And so, I'm like, I'm about to get super vulnerable. I'm about to, I don't know where the, the line is drawn, bro, but 
Bro, like, it got to the point where, like, I felt so convicted about, the, like, having sex with this woman. Mm -hmm. I'm like, when she would want to, like, I couldn't. Like, I couldn't. I'm like, I can't. Like, I, I can't you. bring myself to have Understood. sex with you. And, like, she would try to, like, you know, get me yeah. in the mood. I'm like, I'm not in the mood, dude. Like, I'm not. And, dude, like, the Holy Spirit, like, I feel so bad. Dude, it was, like, 2 in the morning one time. And she's trying to, like, you know. Yeah, I got you. Bro. I didn't have the Bible app on my phone, but in previous years I did. I got a Gmail from the Bible app, bro. Babe, you might not even know this because the Holy Spirit kind of just brought this to my mind, actually. Dude, I got a Gmail from the Bible app, and I, like, look over at my phone, and I'm like, <laughs> I, like, pushed her away, bro. <laughs> Dude, I'm being straight up. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, my bro, gosh. God was just working in my heart, bro. What? The Holy Spirit, like, dude. I, I didn't have people coming to me like evangelizing. Yeah. Like I didn't have people like, you, you know, Bible it, thumping. Honestly. No, bro. The Holy Spirit was just like, Jared, get out of the gutter, bro. And so, dude, for months, I'm feeling this conviction, bro. For like, and it was about a month. I'm feeling this conviction. And I told this girl straight up. I'm like, like, dude, like I kind of want to take my faith serious. Like this is kind of been something like for like a little while, like God's been like, you know, I kind of been feeling guilty about like this, you know, sex thing and like the smoking weed, like I kind of just, I want to take my faith a little bit serious. Like shut me down, bro. Shut me down. Cause her dad was like a devout Catholic, bro. So she was, she probably had some church hurt. Wasn't mm -hmm. liking it. She's like, yeah, no, that's not for me. So mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And also, also, um, I'm not going to mention any names. This is very personal. Yeah. Um, said girl's mom had died when she was really young and gotcha. that caused some problems. And she like wants nothing to do with church, bro. It's like I don't want nothing to do with it. It's sad, but that's kind of a normal thing. It's yeah, like, man, it it, it is sad. Dies or loved one dies and blame God. So, you know what, bro? That's actually what she said to me. Was like, I don't know how I can have a relationship with a God who took my mom from me. She verba that verbatim said that, and so she shut me down, bro. She's like, I nah, no thanks. So. I'd say about two more months go on. And, dude, the Holy Spirit, like, it's just, like, I didn't know it was the Holy Spirit at the time. But looking back, it was the Holy Spirit, like, right. dude, just, just like, prying at my heart, dude. Like, he's just taking the crowbar, and he's, like, trying to get the, the hardness off, man. I started feeling so convicted about my whole life. Like, I remember I would lay in bed, bro. Bro, maybe some of you guys can relate. And I know my wife can. Pauline, maybe you can, John. I don't know how bad your anxiety ever gets, but. I struggle with anxiety really bad. By by the, the glory of God, Jesus has given me a lot of peace, and I am medicated now. But at this time in my life, my anxiety was so bad, bro. I would, like, looking back, they were panic attacks. I had no idea they were panic attacks right. at the time. Like, I would lay in bed, right? And I'd think about the situation in my life. I'd think about this relationship. I'd think about all that I'm doing. And, like, I'd lose my breath, dude. Like, I'd be, I'd, my heart would be racing so fast. I'd, like, lay in bed, and I'm, like... Like shaking, I'm panicking. I'm like, like I, I, I was miserable. Like I hated my life, bro. The, there were panic attacks. I didn't realize it at the time, but now that I've been diagnosed with anxiety, I know those were panic attacks. I'm like freaking out, bro. I'd lay in my bed just miserable, and I'd be like, I don't want to live this way. <laughs> like I don't really want to date this girl. Like I really don't. Like right. I don't. But I just, I couldn't. Like I, I actually, I broke up with her. I told her I'm like, I don't even know if I know want to do this and. And then, like, two days go by, I'm going to get back together for, like, another month and a half, whatever. It was January 5th of 2022. It was a Wednesday night, maybe around 6.30, 7 o'clock. I had driven to Salina to see said girl. I'm sitting in the McDonald's parking lot um, because she was out with her sister or something. I don't know what. She was, like, not home yet. I had to wait for her to get home. I'm sitting in the McDonald's parking lot. I eat dinner. Dude. And I'm, I start having a panic attack. Didn't know what it was at the time, but I start having a panic attack. And I start bawling my eyes out, bro. Like, keep in mind, nobody's evangelizing to me. Nobody's, like, preaching at me. Like, the Holy Spirit's just working on me. Yeah. I'm sitting in a McDonald's parking lot. I start bawling. It's a rainy, cloudy, gross day. Like, this is, dude, I remember this day so clearly. Disgusting day, bro. And I'm, like, hyperventilating, crying. And, and I, I, like, look up. And it's pouring rain. I said... God, I hate my life. I don't want to live this anymore. Like, God, if you are who you say you are, please take this away. Like, I give this, I give this to you. Like, I surrendered. Like, dude, it was crazy, man. I just surrendered to God right there. I was like, God, like, 
like I'm broken. Like I, you, you say you love me and you're like, I, I keep in mind, I, I, I grew up in a church, man. So like, I have this background knowledge. I know about, you know, some Bible stories and stuff. And I know Jesus loves me, man, but I wasn't living it. And I said, God, if you are who you say you are, like, I want this to, ch- I want to change. I put my head down. Like y- y- y'all ever had them, one of them numbers where you're like in your car, you like put your head on the steering wheel, you know what I'm saying? And you're just like kind of laying there, ste- like, bro, like one of those numbers, it's bad. Bro, why are you laughing at me, John? I'm not laughing at you. I just realized um, why you and I are kind of connected in a way. Why? Let me hear it. Um, and I, I really just want to wait to see where that's all going, but uh, I feel like I got it. I feel like I got it, so I'm just going to share this. I had a little bit of the same experience, raised in the church, um, and just wasn't living for him. Had had the understanding of who truth was, just not not living that truth or for that truth, um, and just went into the world, became an addict, trying to fill a void that uh, only Jesus could fill, and I found myself in my car. <laughs> In my driver's seat on 4th of July, 2019, I think it was 2019, 2019 or 2020. I don't know why it's escaping me right now. I think it was 2020 based on previous things you've told me. Was it during COVID? COVID. Yeah, it was during COVID. There we are. Yep, there was. Thank you for that. Uh, July 4th, 2020, in my front seat of my car. And I had done tried everything in my power. Just left a party after I left the bar. And I was, yeah, not happy. And I reached out to Jesus. And I can't remember exactly what I said. I just know that my, my heart and my, my soul was crying out to him. And he answered me. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that is why we're connected, bro. I don't know. We're connected in a few different ways. Bro, because in ahead. a crazy way, bro, we just came friends out of nowhere. We did. We met, and we, that's another topic. We'll talk later. It is. We'll get to that. Bro, and so I, I'm crying out to do this. I have my head on my steering wheel. Bro, and listen, you can think I'm making this up. I promise you I would not lie, bro. Listen, this because this sounds unbelievable. If somebody told me this, I'm like, kind of good. Dude, I look up, and in the middle of this storm, bro, the, you ever see like a break in clouds where like you can see light beams kind of coming down, bro? There was, bro. I look up and there's like a break. I'm getting chills right now. <laughs> there was a break in the clouds, bro, and I saw the sun and it was still sprinkling a little bit, but that thunder storm had stopped and the, there's a break in, in the storm clouds and I saw the sunlight, man. I saw the the blue sky behind those gray clouds, <laughs> man. I'm not lying to you when I say this, bro. God like touched my heart, bro. He like he was like okay I am who I say I am, and um, shout out to my my brother Isaiah Watson, um, a faithful friend to me through all those years. Like he was one of my 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 church group boys that was faithful to the Lord, and when I turned away from God and I walked with the world, Isaiah never turned away from me. He was a real friend to me, and always tried to show me Jesus. I hadn't talked to this kid in like two and a half years, bro, and I call him out of the blue because I knew that he would answer my phone call, and I knew he was walking with Jesus. I called Isaiah after not speaking to him for two years, and he's like, hello? (laughs) Like, he was so taken back because homie hadn't talked to me in years. I was like, bro, like, like, I need you right now. Like, can I please come pick you up? Like, I I, want to give my heart to Jesus. Like, I need you. He's like, dude, come can you pick me up in 10 minutes? Like, let's go. Like, he's been praying for me for years, bro. And so I, 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 I picked him up. We parked in this parking lot, bro. And he's just like smiling ear to ear. He's like, like, dude, like, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm good. I'm not good. I'm good. I'm not good. <laughs> I'm a mess. I don't know. <laughs> I vent to him about everything that was going on in my life. And I was like, bro, like, like all these years you were right. Jesus is better. Like, I want Jesus. And Isaiah that night helped me, you know, you know, the, like the cliche sinner's prayer, give my heart right. to Jesus. And dude, like, I'm not lying to you when I say this. It was like overnight. Like, okay, hold on. Maybe not overnight. The very next day, I had plans to help my aunt move, and two of my work friends were helping us. And that next night, after I, had, you know, met with Isaiah, giving my heart to Jesus, I'm helping these kids move. And, um, like, I'm, I'm still like ripping a vape and stuff. And I sit down and have a beer with these kids. And then I get back to my house and I'm like, whoa, that don't feel right at all. So 
like I threw my vape away and like I'm like I write this stuff off man and I would say it was about four or five months before I was genuinely free from my nicotine addiction um but like right away I put the weed down right away I put the alcohol down I stopped drinking right away um Dude, like, and, like, it was, like, it was kind of a switch that flipped. Like, I, I went to bed. I woke up different, bro. Like, Jesus changed my heart. And, dude, when I tell you, like, I was in, like, reckless pursuit of God, bro, for, like, four months, bro. I'm talking, like, like, I shut everyone out. All those people I was partying with, all my people I was smoking with, bro. She's looking at me smiling because she's about to come into the testimony here soon. Bro, I shut everyone out. I cut, I deleted my socials. I cut everybody off. I'm, like... I'm sold out for Jesus. Bro. Dude, this is great. I'm so invested right now. Dude, so Keep I going. cut them all off. And like, listen, bro, It li this is what my life consisted of. It's so like at this point in my life. So, okay, also here, let me tell you a little more. So I went to trade school for precision machining. Um, so like if any of you in a local area, you know, like Millstream or Apollo, um, or like TriStar for anybody that's down in Mercer County area, they're trade schools. So like while you're in your junior and senior year, half mm -hmm. your day spent in a trade school, you're learning a trade. I did that for precision machining. Um, and when I graduated high school, I got this really good job internship at Grobe Systems over in Bluffton. Shout out to Grobe. Um, it's a, you know, it's a four-year contract I signed. They put me through school. I have a manufacturing mechanical engineering degree. Um, paid for by Grobe, dude. Like this job I got was great, bro. On the job training, I did some traveling and all this. I got technical trade skills, like hands-on job training. And so, I was I would get up at three thirty a.m. My I had this like, bro, like you know those like old-fashioned alarms, bro, where you gotta hit. Yeah, dude, like like the the hammer between two bells, where it's like like real loud. No, I set one up across my room. Two of them actually, bro. Two, one in my like in my closet on the floor, and one on my nightstand because like it's three thirty a.m. Who wants to get up? So no, I, I'd get up at three thirty a.m. I had like the the whole upstairs of my grandma's to myself, right? So it's like three thirty a.m. I'm turning my speaker on with some like KB and Lecrae and Tadashi. My God, bro! <laughs> and I'm getting lit in the morning. I listen to that. I listen to my worship. You know, my Maverick City. I'm like. Whatever, bro. Different type of getting lit. Like, dude, we're not dude getting I'm getting lit. lit. We're no, no, getting I'm not getting lit. lit, like sparking up, getting lit. I'm getting lit, like I'm praising my Jesus, getting lit. Every morning I'm waking up to the worship music. I'd go into work at 5 a.m. I'd work like an 11-hour shift. I'd come home. I'd sit down and like listen to me, bro. I, I, I like, set up a desk in my room for like two and a half, three hours. I'm studying the word. Bro, like I'm, I'm coming home, bro. Like I'd get home, shower because I was gross and sweaty. Get in my PJs, throw my my worship on. I had a freaking TV tray, bro. A TV tray and an office chair that I stole from my grandpa's office, bro. Riley knows because she was there, dude. She comes in here in a second. Every day, bro. I did nothing. Monday to Sunday, I'm coming home, sitting in my room. I'm studying the word. I read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Then I got into Acts, and I like I'm reading, bro. Like crazy, just studying the word, praying. Bro, all with the help of my brother Isaiah Watson, who um, you know, I just talked about, and a couple of other guys, uh, Brandon Howard, um, Zach Lewis, these these three guys um were like sold out followers of Christ. And they really do, they discipled me, bro. I just we me and my wife just met with Brandon two days ago, yesterday. Um and I, I told him this. I'm like, man, like you guys are a big part of why I am who I am today because they poured into me, bro. Like when I am, like when I'm struggling to quit nicotine, when I'm struggling to, you know, all these things, I'm struggling to stop swearing so much. And like, no, I can still listen to my my Drake and my secular rap. They're like, maybe not, dude. Like they're just loving me and discipling me right. and pouring into me, bro. And and bro, what Jesus has done in my heart in two years is crazy, bro. I I was like like gluttonous on the word bro if that's even possible like people get gluttonous with a buffet bro they're eating like four cheeseburgers and all that bro <laughs> i'm eating like so much spiritual food the whole bro. menu of the word of every God. day <laughs> hours and hours just sitting in my room by myself i'm sitting there like i'm having these moments of like i'm crying bro um and dude i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna throw this in here too something because i know for a fact i know at least one person that listened to excuse me, to this podcast is going to have this same thing that maybe they're still struggling with, bro. I was so deep in a pornography addiction, bro. I got you. I was so deep in that addiction, bro. 
Dude, so I started, bro, I was, oh, I was eight years old when I saw porn for the first time. When I, like, before I even moved out of biological mom's house, I'm living over there. Keep in mind, she was an addict, so she didn't really keep tabs on me much. Like, at eight years old, I was allowed to, like, walk, like, two neighborhoods over in, the, like, downtown Lima, like, going to, what I did whatever I want. I'm crossing highways, bro. So I'm at this kid's house that I went to school with and his older brother, bro. I don't even, I dude, I was like maybe, maybe nine years old, bro. And we're just sitting there. We're playing GTA 5, bro. Why we were playing that at eight years old, I don't know. But homie just comes in here and shows us things we shouldn't be seeing. I was eight years old, like eight years old. So like some, like who, who brought it in? The kid's older brother. So the kid's older brother, like what, came in, popped in a VHS tape or what? No, nah, it was that, actually, bro, it was... I think, no, I don't even, I think it was on the Xbox or something, bro. I don't know. It was on the TV, though, bro. It was, I got you. That's kind of a little foggy, but I do know, I do know, all, hey, I know afterwards we watched Boondocks. I do know that. <laughs> bro, it was, a, it was, so I was eight years old, bro. My mind was oh. exposed to that. And, dude, you can imagine the trauma. So, like, you know, I move over to my dad. All this stuff goes on. So, realistically, 13 years old is when I was, like, genuinely, like, addicted to pornography and masturbation. Like, all realness here. 13, I was deep in that addiction. So 13 to 19, that's six years when I gave myself to Christ. That just don't go away overnight, bro. No. Bro, so I remember, like, there'd be times, like, I'd come home from work. I'm two and a half hours in a word, and then I'd give in to that sin, bro, and I'd be, I'd watch porn, bro. And I, Dude, I remember one night, bro. Dude, this is, dude, this was so weird to me at the time, but, like, this is this is the, the truth of the, vulner, the vulnerability an intimacy that you can have with Christ, man. I remember one time, bro, like, I had just, like, watched porn, bro, giving into my flesh, bro. And, like, I'm, like, like, not even, like, put my phone away. I'm, like, crying out to God. I'm, like, God, please help. Like, I I'm so sorry. Like, you know, trying to surrender this to God, bro. I remember, like, in the middle of my act of sin, bro, I'm, like, crying out to God. And so this was, this was like, months. it took me about a year, probably, about a year to get really free from this addiction to pornography. Um... All that to say, um, God did a really, a really big work in me really quick, man. It was, it was, a, it was a switch overnight. Um, and then the only thing that wasn't really overnight was my pornography addiction. Right. Um, so let me let me just talk on that a little bit, um, because I know that this is a problem that Christians, men and women, you know, women are not always super open about it and upfront right. as much as you want to talk about it, but it's not just a male thing. Women can struggle with that too, but I know that Christians so badly struggle with this, and, and it, it's such a strong tactic of the enemy, but the reality is um, you can be free from it. Like at the Amen. end of the day, you can be free from that pornography addiction because I was there. I was in that addiction. Um, <laughs> I'm free by the grace of Jesus Christ. And for me... Um, Maybe you can help me with this, John. Um, give me some insight. But for me, what that looked like was, first of all, understanding that's not by willpower. It's not. Um, and what I mean by that is this. In the Bible, in the Word of God, in almost, actually, no, in, in every situation other than sexual immorality, it says to resist the enemy and he will flee from you. That if you resist temptation by the power of the Holy Spirit, by your willpower, resist the enemy and he will free, flee from you. But when it comes to sexual immorality, when it comes to ad adultery, sexual immorality, you know, pornography, it says to flee from it. It doesn't say to resist. It says to flee. And that realization hit me so hard because, you know, we try to think, you know, like I'm saturated in the word of God and I'm sitting here and I have these temptations on my phone. Let's just be real. I'm yeah. on my phone and I'm scrolling, bro. And then I follow a bodybuilding page. Maybe you're a gym rat. And you're you're following a bodybuilding page, Come bro. On. And you know I'm just following these guys that are like you know like they're jacked, bro. I want I'm I'm you know following their workout regimens, but then all of a sudden that their YouTube vlog they got this female bodybuilder on there, mm -hmm. and she's in a bikini, bro. And that triggers that lustful thought, bro. And you're like, I, well, I wasn't on here to be lustful, but I'm on here just I'm just trying to watch, look at my bodybuilding stuff, you know. And then you keep scrolling, bro. And then 
the, the the other fitness influencer, bro, that they got they got the, another female showing some skin, it triggers these or thoughts. Even man. working out from an angle, like dude, right? Like, bro, show me like straight onto the bar. I don't need like an upshot where you're showing all butt and like <laughs> straight up, that, dude. Let's. I'm I'm glad you kind of broke that ice, bro. Let's, let's just have be real this conversation, my bro, guy. because bro, because that's how it that's how it is. Yeah. I'm not on there. I'm like my goal wasn't to get on Instagram and then end up watching porn and masturbating. Yeah, my algorithm is not set up for that, fam. No, at but, all. But you have these years of lustful desires ingrained within you, and so I, you know, like you get on Instagram and you see these things. If you sit there and dwell on that, and you're like, I plead the blood of Jesus over my mind. The the the, the Bible says that I am, you know, we're more than conquerors. The, the Bible says that we have the ability to trample on serpents and snakes. Like you can sit there and you can, you know, you know, you can you can recite scripture and you can resist and you can use your willpower. Now maybe that works. Maybe that works once, maybe twice. But the fact of the matter is the Bible says to flee from sexual immorality. It does not say to resist. So what that means is, oh, I better shut my phone off and walk out of my bedroom. Oh, I better I better delete Instagram, bro. Listen to me. If you value Instagram more than you value purity in the eyes of God, you got your motives wrong. Ooh. Let me tell you something. I'm a, I'm a married man. I've been married for close to two years now. Why do you think I don't have social media? Because at the end of the day, I have seven years of sexual impurity and sinful lust ingrained in my, 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 my flesh that if we're just being real here, sometimes temptation is too much to bear. So the Bible says, if, you're, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off because it's better for you to enter heaven with one less hand than for your whole body to burn. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. So what that meant for me was I deleted social media. Yeah. So that, that yeah, this doesn't mean just off your hand and pluck your eye out. No, bro. Hand. I'm like, not saying nah. get the saws all, bro. Nah, but bro. what that means is where are your priorities? You're like, well, I'm trying to fight this pornography addiction, but are you though? Like, are you though? Really? Ooh, come on, sir. Do you really want to beat that addiction though? Because if you you're like, I want to beat this addiction, but but you're still following every single one of those accounts and you still spend three and a half hours a day on Twitter, how bad do you really want to stop? Let's be honest. Yeah. And that was so hard for me to realize, man, because I thought I could resist. But the Bible does not say to resist sexual immorality. It says to flee from sexual immorality. Mm-hmm. Immorality. So if you are in that bondage and you're trying to resist it, you're going to stay in that bondage until you flee from that bondage. That's not an overnight thing. Don't hear me wrong. It won't happen overnight. You flee once and it never happens again. It's going to take work. But until you start fleeing, you're going to stay stuck. Oh, I love you right now, my guy. Bro. <laughs> you yes, got something to say have, on that? Listen, we can have this conversation because I will be very open and honest about it. I think we as <clears throat> men in church can kind of either be disconnected when we vocalize subjects like this or we aren't vocal at all. And what I mean by that is, yeah, we can talk about an addiction that we had, but we ain't talking about the real stuff. Like, we're not going into detail. We're not looking at each other and saying, delete the freaking app, my guy. Like, what are you doing? Like, why are you putting yourself in the position to be tempted? Like, yeah, we are to resist the enemy, 100%. If the enemy's tempting you in an area, especially pornography, like, hear me, guys, like, you guys might have short attention spans like we do, but I've looked at my analytics. My you, my uh, analytics, my, I, about 75% of our demographic is men, and they're around our ages, 20 to 35. And listen to me, men. Where are your priorities? You got to answer that question right now. If it's for Jesus, okay, we got to make some changes. We got to be real with ourselves. If it's not, and you haven't gotten there yet, but you're trying to better your life and make better decisions, we got to make better choices. Now, wherever you're at within the process, let's make those right choices. Let's be mature. Let's look ourselves in the mirror and get real with ourselves. Are these apps, are these social media platforms, platforms, are these movies, are these books, 
are is any of the con the content that you're consuming benefiting you or getting you closer to God? And if it's not, you need to you need to take accountability for your own actions. I'm gonna be you want a vulnerable moment? This thing is dangerous. Okay. I know this thing's dangerous. So I act accordingly and I have struggled. I have gotten to the point where I will not have two apps on my phone. One of them is Twitter. The other one, don't really want to mention. <laughs> it's not any better than Twitter, though. It's actually, like, way worse. But actually, I'll mention it. This is a real room. Twitter and uh, Reddit. Twitter and Reddit, my guy. Those things are unhinged. Bro, and there's no filter. There's bro, no, no filter, filter whatsoever. And you can go on, like, a non-sexual, like, uh, a non-sexual, especially Twitter. It's like, Twitter, you can go on a non-sexual, like, thing. Go into the comments, boom, sex right in your face. It's crazy. And it's gotten to the point where I'm like, no, I don't trust myself. Here, here I, we're no, we're gonna have this conversation, my guy. I'm not trying to like take all the talking, but no, no we're talk, gonna bro. have this conversation because I know myself. I am aware of myself. And it is not by might nor by power, but by his spirit that I can do things that me and myself and uh, alone cannot do. And I know that I am weak in some in some ways. So Pauline, my wife, I hand my wife my phone. I'm saying, make it to where I can't download these apps. Make it to where I can't search these websites. <clears throat> because I'll have a vulnerable moment, just like you're talking about. Like when I'm scrolling on Instagram, I've gotten I've gotten Instagram to it's where it's just dogs. And food. I love Instagram. Dogs and food. That's all you get on my IG. Facebook, bro, that thing throws sex at you here and there. And I like, I'm to the point where I gotta, like, I can't be doom scrolling. But I've gotten it to the point where I'm like, listen, I don't trust myself sometimes. And I need to make sure that I am covered and my wife covers me. And these vulnerable moments, like a lot of people just don't want to be vulnerable about it. Some people just don't want to be real about it. Like, hey, this is where I'm struggling and I need help because I can't do it myself. Bro, and and also the thing, sorry, were you done? Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, go for it. We're going to pass this ball back and forth because it does say, let's, oh, wait here. There, there's the full circle because it does say that, that, yeah, you can resist the enemy. That means resist temptation. But yep. when it comes to sexual immorality, God tells us to flee from it because of how powerful sex is. God made sex a powerful thing. Amen. It is so beautiful and so powerful. And the enemy, the devil, has perverted a beautiful thing. And he has tried to turn it into a thing that needs to be plagiarized or out there for display. And, and we just need to... Uh, if I could say it this way, we we don't hold it in such high regard any longer. But the things of God, the things that God created and called good, including very good, sex between a man and a woman in a marriage, we need to hold those things in high regard. So when we start holding something that needs to be in high regard, at a, in, lo, in low regard and no respect for it, it starts to get out of control. And sexual immorality will literally rob you. Amen. Bro, so you talked about, uh, you know, self-control, talked about knowing yourself. And I want to add to this too, like, how hard do you fight this and the lengths you're willing to go to, in a way, will show how much you really want Jesus. Oh, yeah, and it'll deter determine your success. That's the truth, because... At the end of the day, Jesus Christ, when he calls us to follow him, he doesn't say, like, bring like bring all your bags, bro. Like, pack up everything you have and come with me. He says, like, drop everything and follow me. Yep. Bro, there was, I think, it, so help me out here, John or Pauline or Riley. Um, in one of the Gospels when Jesus is talking to a lawyer, I believe, and he tells him to follow him. He's like, the man's like, hold on, like, let me go tell my family goodbye. Let me go tell my my wife and my kids. Let me go tell them my family goodbye and, like, you know, pack, bring some of my belongings and stuff. And Jesus is like, no, like, if you want to follow me, like, I have to be more important in those things. Like, you have to be willing to walk away from all of that. Mm -hmm. So where I'm going with this is, what are you willing to sacrifice, man? 
if you really want to walk with Jesus, what are you willing to sacrifice? Here's a, a testimony in my own personal life, like just recently, bro. Like here's the reality of this, okay? Here's how real this gets. So this pornography addiction that I had, I was be, before I married Riley, I was free from it. And for over a year into our marriage, I was free from it. I had a little bit of a relapse, man. Um, I don't know how long ago. It was it was a while back. It was maybe eight months ago. And I was vulnerable with Riley about it. No, it wasn't even eight months ago, man. Maybe six months ago. Vulnerable with Riley about it. We're being real. Um, and I took John's advice. Um, and I had Riley do the same thing, put restrictions on my phone. Like, I know myself. I need help. Um, and, and God delivered me from that. Um, and and I, I moved forward. But where I'm going with that is this. Riley and I were watching this show, man. We got into this show and she's she's laughing right now because she was salty at first because this was a it was like a good juicy show, bro. So it's a show called Love Is Blind. Okay. Oh God. <laughs> this show is like so corny, it's so, so cheesy. Corny. What do you mean? It's so cheesy, bro. But it, like, no, it's reality. This I was, is real no, life. It was this not is real love. I was kind of getting into it low key, bro. <laughs> and then okay, so listen. Okay, I got Riley you. and I don't really vibe on the same kind of like show topics, right? Like genres. Oh, no way. I like action and all this, like you know, like let me get like suspense thriller. And she's like, I want to watch dating shows. Like I want to see love movies. Oh my god, bro. So god. we don't vibe on that. But I was kind of getting in, in, into the show, and so like we never have shows to watch together. We're mm-hmm. watching it together, bro. We're like spending some good quality time. It got to a point in the season though. Um, where they, dude, I'll just be real. There, there was some women showing a lot of skin, bro. Right. Like they're on beaches and they're in these swimsuits, like, like swimsuits that are like not even swimsuits, bro. Like there's just like a piece of cloth. It's bro. a string, bro. String bad. with a rag. Yeah. String with a rag. Like bad, bro. And they're sexualizing these women and they're like showing them all up on their mans and stuff and all this. Right. I got, we, we got like halfway through that episode and I, I literally told Riley, I'm like, Hey, like you, I, she texted me or something. I was at work. She's like, it's getting so juicy. I can't wait to watch it. I'm like, just watch it, bro. Like, just watch it. She's like, no, like, I'm going to wait for you. Like, no, like, I can't watch this. Like, I I, I don't want to watch this because if I continue watching this, it's going to cause me to stumble, and I want to honor you. And she was mm. like, oh, okay. So she was a little bit frustrated at first. She's like, you know, like, he was, like, looking at these girls. Like, but then after a couple of hours, she was like, hey, like, I'm really proud of you. Like, thank you for, like, knowing yourself and honoring me and that because – because I know that if I were to continue watching that show, it would cause me to stumble in my lust because it's just flaunting these women's bodies around. And I'm a man who struggled with pornography addiction for seven years. And I knew that if I continued watching that show, which in and of itself, like the show was just, you know, something we're watching. We're just bonding. We're just having a good time together. But I'm like, I can't do this anymore because it's going to cause me to stumble. If I continue watching this, I will fall into sin. And so... I said, I'm not going to watch this show anymore. I'm sorry that we, you know, let's find another show, but I can't do this. I was willing to sacrifice that quality time with my wife because I don't want to dishonor Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made. I don't want to dishonor my lovely wife who God has given me. And I don't want to dishonor this temple of the Holy Spirit. And I know that if I continued watching that show, which would spark my lust, I would have done that. So you have to be willing to sacrifice things that are that are you know easy and fun for you. You have to be willing to give things up. Cut your hand off, man. Delete the socials. Stop watching that show. I had to stop watching a show because it was going to cause me to lust. So what are you willing to sacrifice for your relationship with Jesus Christ? Yo. I feel like a lot of men are not willing to sacrifice much. That's the nah. truth. People, we're not gonna tie. We're not gonna tie it just to men. No, but you I know don't what? Like it when people just bully men, you like, know, people are going through this. Women you know, go through it as well. But listen, you know, you, you even made the comment. A lot of the demographic on this podcast is men in their twenties yeah. to thirties. Bro, man, you gotta stand up and be leaders. Come on, man. That's the end of the day. Stand up and be a leader. Like if you know, and maybe I'm talking to husbands right now. Like, if your wife sees you not willing to make sacrifices for your relationship with Christ, what makes you think she's gonna want to, man? So at the end of the day, like, what are you willing to sacrifice, bro? Like, as men, yes, women do struggle with this addiction, too. I get that, and I'm not d- deterring from that. But, you know, primarily, this is something men struggle with. Yeah. A lot of men struggle with this. And I, I think if you did a statistical analysis, a majority of the, you know, s- surveys that admitted to having a pornography addiction, they'd probably be men. Right. Right. And so what are you willing to sacrifice, men? 
What are you willing to sacrifice to look more like Jesus Christ, married or not? I don't care if you're single, you're dating. I don't care. You know, aside from all of that, what are you willing to sacrifice? Because, because, dude, you got to sacrifice stuff. You got to you got to lay your life down. And that that the thing, the fact of the matter is, we're just not willing to do that anymore because we've marginalized our faith. And dude, that and we're just. Yeah, I love that you said. It. First and foremost, I don't, I do not want to skip over this, girl. Give me five. Like, <laughs> yes, dude. I am so. Look at your man. He loves you, dude. That is. Oh my gosh. Yes, bro. You, my guy, are. Dude, you're you're so good. I, dude, I'm proud of you. If if you ain't got no older man to tell you, acting like I'm not old, but um. If you don't have just a man in general or somebody to tell you they're proud of you, bro, I'm proud of you. That's so awesome that you would literally do that because women, our wives, need to feel honored. And to be able to, one, have a space in which you guys can communicate a vulnerable thing and be honest about that and for you to not hold it against him when he's being vulnerable and honest and turn it against him is just so one it's mature and two it, it it'll benefit your marriage because is it really quality time if it's not benefiting one or if it's not glorifying God and then also benefiting your marriage because that quality time could sooner or later probably affect other quality time you know what i mean and then boom things are lost and we don't want any of that but yeah i just wanted to tell you i'm proud of y'all yeah that's dope and but yeah um also to get back on topic though i completely agree with you i completely agree with you whether and i, I just want to i just want to make sure that i i say this correctly like this isn't just for people who follow jesus though because pornography and all these perverted uh, forms of sex literally kills your brain. It's statistically proven. They did research, bro. This pornography kills. It hurts you. And it, it causes you to, like, it causes the effect that it has on your body and your brain are not healthy. And it leads you away from... Uh, the things in or it leads you away from uh being focused uh and also it leads you away from like like there's so many things like my brain's going in so many different directions but whether you follow jesus or not if you're not willing to make that sacrifice you're you're not going to you're not going to accomplish your goals if you are a believer of jesus you ain't going to accomplish your goals and you ain't going to be glorifying god am i making sense here just because like this this type of a or this area of just culture and life in general, like we are lacking and we're failing a lot. And I think it's because we're not one willing to make that sacrifice. And I think that is because we're not able to be honest with ourselves, get real and be like, this is a problem and I need help with it. And then two, we're not turning to the right thing to replace it because that's all it is. It's filling a hole. It's filling a void. All pornography does, all masturbation does, all drugs do is numb you and try to fill a God-sized hole inside your heart that can only be filled by Jesus Christ. So we're not, we're not turning to the, the, the real thing that we need, the real thing that our soul needs that isn't just going to leave us numb, but actually is going to fill us with every single good thing that we need. And that's Jesus Christ. And I just think that if we could get real with ourselves and we could be honest and turn to the right thing, or I should say the right person, uh, we would be in a much better place, not only um, in our lives, but also in our marriages. Yeah, dude, that was good. That's heavy, bro. It's heavy, but you know what? Like you said, um, people just don't want to be vulnerable about it. Vulnerable about it. People just don't want to open up about this situation, and it needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, it really does. So, and I'm not saying put it out here on display. Like, I'm not, I'm not one who need like would say that 
when talking about your testimony or like what you're struggling with and this and that, like you don't need to be out in yourself to everybody. Like I'm trying to think how to say this, bro. Like, yeah, you could be struggling with something. Find a brother, find a sister, whatever gender you are, whether you're a man or a woman, like find somebody that you can confide in and be honest with. And go to them when you're struggling. This is part of relationship. This is why this platform exists. Like, I don't need to be out here. Oh, I like <clears throat> updating my Facebook status. Like, oh, I fell again. Like, yeah, like right. no, nah, bro, don't Get be out here Twitter, doing nah. that. Like, no, like that is not what, that's not what we're saying. But find a group of people who are desiring the same thing and that's to become a better human being that's yeah. to go after jesus i'm talking like whether you believe in jesus or not like pornography kills sin kills all these things drugs kill alcohol kills all these things are not good for you so find people who are like-minded who want the same thing and do not want these things and want them out of their lives find a support group if you're a christian find other christians if you're not a christian Find a Christian because I'm telling you it's gonna make your life yeah, better. Bro. Uh, like I'm, I'm saying here, I'm like I'm not trying to dip into two pots, but I know that some people have a problem with religion. It's not that they have a problem with Jesus; they have a problem with Christians misrepresenting Jesus or yeah. religion and all that thing, all that. But I'm saying find people who are like minded and can go after the same goal and that can give you the support that you need to go through this. Um, because as honest as I can be with my wife, I don't need to come to her with this every single time. I don't. And that's something that's also not talked about is I don't need my wife who uh, may have a bad day to become vulnerable and the enemy may come and try to steal her security and make her feel insecure about her looks and all these other things just because I fell. Now, that's not saying I'm not going to be honest with her. Right. That's not saying I'm going to keep the secret from her, but I'm also going to make sure that I get my accountability um, right. and a friend and somebody that can hold me accountable. So, so just to hit on that really quick, yeah. Um, just maybe I want to hopefully bring some clarity. Like the fact of the matter is, God created men and women differently. Amen. In very specific ways and reasons. So, like for me, when I was really battling the thick of this pornography addiction, I had a group chat, bro. Literally. Me and three other of my brothers. Actually, I already mentioned other names, bro. They would not care if I shared this. Me, Brandon, Isaiah, and Zach, because they're also very open about this. We were all in a group chat, bro. And, like, if if one of us slipped, we'd text and be like, hey, bro, like, I just gave in. Can we pray? Bro, like, you know how hard that is? Bro. To, like, give in to your pornography and masturbation addiction and then get on your phone and be like, hey, boys, like, can we pray? I just... But that's the accountability it takes, bro. That's that's what yeah. it takes. And that's honestly, that's really what got me through that. Yes, it was Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But with the help of mm -hmm. the fact that I had a, a group of brothers that I could go to, be like, hey, I need help. And also, you know, when it comes, you know, I want to hit on what you said about the wives and, and whatnot. God created men and women differently mm -hmm. to fill different roles for certain reasons. And his will is sovereign. Not hiding your pornography addiction from your wife is what needs to be on, be done. You can't hide that from your significant no. other. But like John was saying, you know, if you're struggling every single day, going to your wife every single day. So I just want to, okay. This is full circle. Are you doing what, what needs to be done? Yeah, right. <laughs> so this is why I'm full saying circle. this, okay? <laughs> so God created men, men and women differently. And she's going to receive information differently than you do. Oh, absolutely. Or than your friends do. So, like, when I was, you know, kind of venting to Riley about some things and being vulnerable with her about some things I was struggling with, it was about a, a period of, like, three weeks that I would come to her. I came to her a couple of times. I'm like, hey, like, I need, you know, prayer. I'm struggling. And by the grace of God, he helped me to have the discernment to understand that every time she heard that, right, Here's what that did. I had this burden on my chest, right? And it's like it's weighing me down and it's heavy and I feel guilty. And so I'd take that burden off of me and I'd put it on Riley's chest and she's walking around dragging this weight. 
she just took I just took the burden off of me and put it onto her. Now she's feeling insecure. She's feeling super vulnerable. Like John said, does my husband desire me? Am I really good enough for him? She's uh-huh. carrying this weight around. In my head, I'm like, the situation's good. Like I communicated. Yeah, it's I, off my I'm chest. Good. Like, and I'm and, <laughs> and dude, you could be good. Like you could be free, and you could be like, you know what? It's been like two months. I I, I I've been free. I've been good. I'm and, and I'm walking and following Jesus Christ. But she still is carrying that ba- baggage because she's like, does my husband really desire me? And so what John was saying is to understand that as men, as husbands, you know, we're talking about husband being a husband in this specific, you know, spot. As a husband, man, you're called to be a leader and example, right? And this is something we could get into maybe later too, but you have to know that sometimes, bro, this is going to this is going to be hard to hear for some people maybe. If your wife's freedom and stability means you got to hurt, then you just got to hurt, bro. Here's what I mean by that. If I'm feeling convicted and I'm struggling and I feel, you know, shameful and I'm feeling horrible as a husband, if offloading that onto my wife means that I feel free, but she carries that weight, it's not the right choice, man. It's not. Mm. So, man. Sometimes as a husband, you're gonna have to learn, man, that you might be hurting, but God, God said you're gonna have to hurt a little bit, man. But if what that means is I'm making sacrifices and I'm carrying weight and fighting a battle silently to my wife, so that she can feel free. And I can guard her feminine femininity in Christ. You just gotta do it, bro. So what John was saying is, husbands have discernment. Be vulnerable with your wife. Be open with your wife, and let her know you're struggling. But don't write out every single tiny little small detailed script because she does not read that kind of print like you do. No, nope. you read it as I'm a man with flesh and I'm struggling and I really desire to lead my household, but I'm hurting. Now, my brother John's going to understand that. And when I call my brother John, he's going to say, all right, let's chop it up because I know what you're feeling. But if I tell Riley that, she's going to, oh, man, like I don't have that good of a leader. He doesn't really want to lead me. He's not really trying. He's not really. When that's really not even the truth. Come on, sir. It, I, I do want to lead. I do want to serve. I do want to surrender. I do want to be the example. I do want to be a good head of my household. But I'm just hurting, man. Sometimes your hurt does not need to be your wife's hurt. Ooh. That's what John was saying, man. We built different. I just, yeah. We, we, no, look, look, you know, you can be cliche, but God built us different. We, we're, God built us different, man. And so I just wanted to try to bring clarity to that because that, that can be a hard thing, man. That can be hard. Somebody maybe maybe could have heard that and been like, is you serious that I'm supposed to just like suffer for my wife? No. And I'm never. No, bro. <laughs> like, yes and no. You know what I mean? But yeah, just just have discernment, husbands. And if you really want to beat this addiction, what are you willing to give for it? That's yeah, yeah that's my two and cents. And just know you ain't gonna beat it alone. No. Nope. Nah. You need you need your wife, you need friends, and above all, you need God. Amen. So, um Wow, how do we transition now, bro? That was a little heavy. Oh, you were getting ready to see full circle. I'm here I'm here to keep you on track. Um you were getting ready to talk about how you and Riley met, but then, yes, but oh then, my gosh. But then you had to get into all that, but now that we're through that, I would like to know because we we've heard some things. Um, I'm so ready for this, bro. Okay, yeah, don't so, spare the details. How did you and Riley meet? So Riley and I actually have known each other since when I first moved to Salina. When uh, I was what age? I was nine. We went to school together. Um, we knew of each other. We didn't really know each other as friends until was it seventh grade? Yeah. So I moved to Salina sixth grade. Okay. The next so after about a year. So we know each other kind of as friends, you know. Um, we're just mutual people, I guess. You know, like see each other at the Friday night football games and were you peeping on him before he knew you? Yeah, you had your eye on him. Girl, dude, this girl. <laughs> Eighth grade year, we were like texting, talking, bro, and we were like, bro, I remember one time, dude, it was like, you know, like, bro, like, you're like 13, 14, you're having this like late night text conversation. Gosh. And like, dude, nothing good comes of this. No. And, bro, she's all. asking, she's Parents, asking me. take your phones bro, from your kids seriously, after bro. nine. 
Bro, seriously. Nine o'clock, take the phones, bro. So we're having <laughs> these real, random. Good happens. <laughs> <laughs> bro, I'm telling you some of the stuff that could have been prevented if I didn't have a phone past Jeez. 10 o'clock, bro. Amen to that. Whew. So we're texting, having these just random conversations, bro. I was trying to be cool and like flirty as a little 14 year old. Like, what are you doing? Bro, she asked me, we're asking these vulnerable, like, to be honest, questions, right? She asked me who I thought the prettiest girl in our grade was and did not say her, bro. Oh! No! She you had failed the test, bro. Fat crush you on me. The test. She's like, bro, I wanna hang out with you. I wanna, you know, let's be friends. We can be. And so, like, so, like, who's the prettiest girl in our grade? I said this other name, bro. And she's like, oh, okay. So, dude, <laughs> For real? this is like the origins, bro. Freshman year, we're talking. Like, at this time, we're about 15, you know, so it's still not really a serious relationship, but we're a little bit more comprehensive of, like, oh, we're boyfriend and girlfriend. Like, we're supposed to, like, be devoted to each other. You know what I mean? Like, let's be... Okay. Yeah, so we're talking. Um, oh, here we go. I'm about to say, like, okay, so you go from, like, texting... Yeah, like, texting. Not knowing each other to texting, texting and Texting, yeah, we're, like, mutual friends, mutual flirting. Mutual friends. And, and we're talking. We're, like, kind of flirty, like, yeah. Like, I don't think we ever actually, like, really hung out, bro. I would ghost her all the time, bro. That's why I'm going. Listen, bro. We're talking, right? And, bro, babe, you got a mic. Can you tell this part? Bro, so she, she's not a talker. She came to one of my football games, hey, listen, dude. If this man tries to justify anything or, like, doesn't tell the detail. You, bro. you, you look at me, you say, John, I'm ready. And I'll, I'll throw your mic up. Dude, and- so, dude, I'm, I'm just going to out myself. I'll be real. She came to one of my football games, bro. I'm a freshman. I'm playing JV football. Saturday morning, bright and early. She comes to one of my games to watch me, bro. And after the game, you know, like everybody runs out on the field. We won that game, too. Come out on the field. You know what I'm saying? And everybody like, oh, let's celebrate the victory. And, like, she wants to come get a picture with me. And, like, oh, my man's watching that. I didn't talk to her, bro. I took pics with other girls, bro. What? <laughs> bro, I'm serious. Where was, is this button? Hold on. I'm afraid to know. Like, hit it. I really want to do that. Wah, wah, wah. Bro, bro, I was so bad to her. No. So then, like, she was like, "What the heck?" I ghosted her. I just stopped talking to her. Bro. You just straight text him. I ghosted, doing, bro. And you just I ghosted. did not answer her. Left on red. Left on red. Then, bro, low key, it was like not even like a month later. My cousin has a grad party. Okay. I think is it your family friend? That's how you knew these people. Yeah. From- yeah, so her brother played on um, a church basketball league, and the families were friends. So she's at this same grad party, bro. And I'm sitting there, and she walks in, bro, and I'm like, keep my head down, bro. She walks in, didn't say a word to her, bro. Didn't make eye contact with her. I wouldn't look at her. Wouldn't were, go in. were you looking at him? Were you looking? Okay, I'll talk. Can, how close do I need to be? No, that's good. good. We can hear you. Okay, so I walk into this grad party, and, like, my mom took me to this football game. Okay, so she takes me to this football game, and I'm showing her the guy. I'm like, all right, it's that one right there. Like, he's playing really good right now. She's like, oh, okay. And so she brings me out to the field because I was homeschooled. So I got homeschooled in my eighth grade year. So I was homeschooled, so she come with me. And so I'm showing her, and he's taking pictures with other girls. So I'm like, all right, Mom, let's go. I'm over it. Like, I'm out. Not doing it. Dang. So then it was like the next week or something. Like, yeah, was, like maybe two weeks. It was the grad party. And so I walk in. There he is, and I'm like, Mom, he's here. He's literally here. Okay, so this was like grad party with parents and everything. Yeah. Yes, bro. Yeah, I was like, he's here. And she's like, where, where? And like, me and my mom are close. So I'm like, I'm telling her. Oh, she's probably ready to beat this yeah. boy up for I'm you. I'm like, he's right <laughs> there. I think we stayed at this grad party for like 10 minutes. And I was like, let's go. I'm done. Like, I do not want to be. Like, didn't say hi to me or anything. Yeah. Man, Dude, okay, so I you was ghosted shady. her. Yeah, so you ghosted her. So, okay. That happened. And then she moved. <laughs> then so her family moved to Indiana. Um her her parents got jobs. Well, yeah, over there. there's no reason to stay, man. Bro, it has nothing know, to right? do with the parents having jobs, bro. She's like, hey guys, I'm out. I, I gotta need get y'all. Away from I need Jared. y'all to get new jobs. We're ready to relocate. This man ain't about it. Bro, it was rough. So that she moved, man. And we didn't talk for four years. She went to high school in Indiana. Um, and she was doing her thing over there. We didn't have really we didn't have contact at all, I don't think. Yeah, no, none, no contact. But you already know your boy was like stalking the Instagram and like. Oh yeah, because you you really did like her. Bro, you just, I did. For a and football player, you don't even know when you fumbled. 
Bro, <laughs> uh, I didn't play offense, bro. I was on defense. <laughs> you kidding me, bro? I can see a fumble a mile away here. Bro, <laughs> like... so I'm stalking her Instagram. And, like, you know, I was in the flesh. She was in the flesh. So I'm looking at Shardy on Instagram. I'm like, oh, he's so fine, bro. Like, I'm gawking at her all four years, bro. Like, I'm in relationships. And, like, bro, I remember we'd, I, I'd be at parties, bro. And she would get brought up. And I'm like, yeah. They're like, bro, you dropped the bag on that, bro. I'm like, I know, bro. I know. And she's just gone now. Well, then, <laughs> you know, 2022 rolls around. I gave my heart to Jesus. A month later, her birthday's on Valentine's Day, bro. Your birthday's on Valentine's John, Day? John, you knew this. You're a fake friend, John. You I forgot. This. Listen, you told I'm her in, happy I'm, birthday. I'm sorry. Hold on. Wait. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I'm going to head. Listen, I'm lost in this story right now. So okay. So I'm, I'm here. So it's her birthday. Um, and I saw her posting on Snapchat and Instagram. Like, she moved back in cold water. She's single now. She's not with dude that she was with. I'm like, what? So I just reach out. Happy birthday. That's all I said. But happy birthday. She texts back. She goes, oh, my goodness. Thank you. It's been so long. Bro, and we start chopping it up, man. And and, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, okay, so like I know she was, you know, following Jesus. Like she has like some pictures on Instagram, like when she got saved and all this. And, she, you know, she she had backslid and she had walked away from her faith. And that's her story to tell. I won't tell it. Um, but she walked away from her faith. Um, and then she, she was like kind of coming back to her faith. At that point, she was like at this point where she's like in a really, really bad life situation, life crisis. And she's like, I kind of want to follow Jesus. But like she was still living in the world. So I reached out to her. Happy birthday, bro. And dude, she she started getting so annoyed with me because I'm like at this time, I'm on fire for Jesus. This is my like three hours a day in the word, no life type of phase in my life. I'm like calling her. I'd call her at like 9 p.m., bro. She'd like be at the bar, bro like drinking at the bar. I'm like, Hey, can I pray for you? She's like, sure. She'd like step outside at the bar and I'm praying for her over the phone. Or like we'd be texting <laughs> and I'd be like, you know, this Bible verse made me think of you. I'm like preaching Jesus to her like crazy, bro. Slowly, but surely long story short, she's like, okay, this, you know, this guy's kind of cool, whatever. So she like kind of starts getting back into her faith, man. She's like, I'm done going to these bars. I'm done going to the clubs. Like she's following Jesus now. She's like, I, I want this too. Like I got through to her, right, bro? And so like, we're kind of like following Jesus together, you know, I guess like we're talking about our faith and we're kind of like sharing Bible studies together and stuff. Ghosted her again, bro. <laughs> Dude, I swear. Hold on, bro. <laughs> Listen, hold so no, I was no, 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 bro. No. I gotta hold explain. Up. Just gotta Are give you that telling a me not even the Holy Ghost is gonna keep you from ghosting this woman, <laughs> bro? Listen. <laughs> so I was what? at a point where I was like so new to my faith. Yeah, I was literally. like, I don't want this girl to distract me. So like <gasps> she's gonna pull me okay, away from God. I got you. She's gonna pull me away from my faith. I can't do this, bro. All right, I respect it, but I'm just so saying. I ghosted. <laughs> She's over here shaking her head, bro. So I ghosted her. Um, uh, and it, about a month goes by. <laughs> she's a snare, bro. I need to stay faithful to God. <laughs> she's trying to. <laughs> she's the enemy. <laughs> she's gonna eat an apple, Jezebel. <laughs> Dude, no, Stop. no, she's a blessing. Oh, I know it, but it's just a fact. It's it's funny. We can at the laugh time at she was now. a stumbling block, though. Yeah, we can we can laugh at it. Uh, now. Okay, so a month goes by. And there is this um, woman in my life, an elder woman. She was my one of my best friends, girlfriend's mom. Best friend, girlfriend's mom. She's like a, a biblical scholar, bro. This woman is a spirit-filled woman, like so wise. She was she's a stay-at-home mom her whole life. So like her job was raising her daughters and studying the word. Like she went to school and stuff. Like she prayed up. This woman is prayed up. And so, like, we would meet, like, every week. She's doing Bible studies, like, hours and hours. We're sitting there. She's just pouring into us and praying over us, and she's teaching us so much. And so, like, I've grown to confide in her because at that time in my life, I didn't really have any, like, Christian elders, right? I had nobody but her. Excuse me. Sorry. So I'm confiding, I'm confiding in her about this Riley situation. And so a month goes by, and I call Brooke. Her name's Brooke. I'm like, Brooke, I think I might have made a mistake. Like, I really think about Riley a lot. Like, I think about her all the time. And Brooke's asking me all these questions, you know, like, you know, why do you think you made a mistake? And she's just picking out my brain and getting to understand where I'm at. John, when I tell you the Holy Spirit does something crazy, bro. An hour later, maybe, bro, she, Riley texts me. 
Riley texted me on that day. I was in college at this time. I'm sitting in the, in the Road State parking lot. I'm, I'm I'm on the phone with Brooke, venting to her about the situation. Right. Later, I'm in class. Riley texts me. I haven't talked to her in a month. I didn't text her first. She texts me. She's along the lines of, hey, you know, I know we haven't talked in a month, and you just kind of, you know, went ghost on me. I just, maybe I want some clarity. Like, I'm not really sure why. Like, I really, I miss talking to you. You really helped me get back to my faith. Like, I kind of miss you. Am I doing this justice, babe? Yeah. Like, you helped me get back to my faith. Like, I kind of miss you. Like, I, I really enjoyed talking to you. Like, you're the you're the reason why I started following Jesus again. Like, if you could just give, maybe give me some clarity. Like, why'd you ghost me? Like, that, I, I just need some clarity. And I was like, all right, God. All right. <laughs> what, so, hold on real quick. What did Brooke say? What was her advice? Her advice was, well, she asked me why I felt like I made a wrong choice. And okay. long story short, she said that... I need to keep praying about it. And if I really feel like I made a mistake, just reach out to her. There you go, guys. It's that easy. Yeah. Listen, we need to stop over. I, I just seen a moment, a teaching moment right there. I'm like, we always want to be like, no, I need God to move. I need God to give me a word. And and then and then it's just as simple as pray about it and send the text. Send the text. Make the call. <laughs> Bro, at the end of the day, you'll receive the no by going through the process. If you Bro. get a yes, guess what? And it was a yes and amen, brother, because <laughs> now we are almost two years into marriage. <laughs> all right, so uh, you guys had that conversation and started texting. Yeah, bro, so she texted me and all this stuff, and I was like, all right, God, I see you, like you're working. So I texted her, and I just kind of told her my heart. I was like, this is crazy. I just talked about you today. I call her. We just vent. And we talked on the phone for like an hour or something. I'm just telling her how I feel. Like, this is why I did it. I was insecure. I didn't want to stumble from my faith, bro. From that day, we start talking and we're getting flirty and we're like, okay, wow, like we're actually like pursuing Jesus together. Like, this is cool. I remember the night, bro, I asked her to be my girlfriend. This is so cringy, bro. I'm at her. I'm at her. <laughs> I'm, I'm at here her for the cringe. Bro, I go to her mom's apartment. Um, and looking back, it was like a weird situation because, like, as Christians, I don't condone this. But we were alone. We were at her mom's apartment. We're just chilling. We didn't do anything, you know, like that we shouldn't have done. Right. We're just at her mom's apartment. We ordered some bowling alley food. I think it was bowling alley. And uh, we're eating, and we had been kind of talking about it, right? Like, hitting around with the fact that, like, I was into her, and she was like, yeah, let's take this serious. Like, you know, like, we're talking about we're talking about going exclusive. Yeah. So we're sitting there, and I, I was being so cringe, bro, because I'm just going to keep it real. Like, when you become a Christian, bro, it kind of takes your game away, dog. <laughs> Before the Holy Spirit, bro, I could spit game, bro. Like, I'm not saying it like boat, but like. Well, that's because you know you're lying. Bro, that's that's <laughs> facts, bro. And I'm saying all these lustful things, bro. But when I'm I just saying. when I got the Holy Spirit, though, I'm like, I don't know how to spit game at this girl, bro. I can't. So, <laughs> so you can't lie. No, I can't. So like, I'm just being real. And so I'm being so cringy, bro. And I'm like, you know, I have some. I, I want to talk about something. And she's like, well, what do you want to talk about? I'm like, you know, like I have, you know, like I have these feelings, man. And like I do, like I just, I think you know where I'm going with this. Like, and she was like, well, I know where you're going with this. It's so cringe, bro. She's like. I, I know where you're going with this. And I was like, okay, what am I going to ask you then? She was like, well, I don't know. I don't know. What are you going to, bro? So cringe, bro. Like 13 <laughs> year old us is back again. She's like, I don't know what you want to say. I'm like, you do know what I want to say. I just want <laughs> dude. So like 25 minutes, we're going back and forth and we're sitting there. But you say it. Yeah. No, you, say you say it. it. No, you you say exactly it. like that. <laughs> and we're sitting there and I'm, we're laughing, bro. And I'm like, Riley, She's like, what? I'm like, I'm really into you. Like, I want you to be my girlfriend. Like, just me and you. And she was like, no. <laughs> John, when I tell you, I was shell shocked. <laughs> We're sitting on this couch, bro. I, 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 I take the vulnerable step. I say all these things about how I feel. I want you to be my girlfriend. I said, you know, will you be my girlfriend? No. With a stone cold face, bro. And I, I'm saying like, she let me marinate for like 10 seconds. And I said, okay, I understand. She goes, I'm just kidding. Of course I will. <laughs> bro, I, dude, I am. Hold up, bro. Time out. Time out. Sorry. <laughs> Time out. Pauline. So we had a cringy moment too. I remember being in your kitchen sitting on your countertop and I'm like, so I kind of like you and um I want you to be my girlfriend. What'd you say? I said 
<laughs> this is why like. we're friends, John. I know what it's like, bro. Literally, we have the same experiences. That's why this God is brought ridiculous. us together. Ridiculous! Oh my God. <sighs> You guys both just kind of stink, bro. I don't. Bro, you guys are a bunch of stinkers. You have anything to say for yourselves? No, I'm gonna get your back from all the ghosts. Facts, so. Pauline. What's I your excuse? I deserve that. Gotta keep you on your toes. <laughs> She's like, you don't know what you're gonna get, <laughs> bro. So th- that that's where it was. We became boyfriend and girlfriend, and she, dude, she hates me that I'm so cringe about this. I remember the, all of these dates, bro. It was April 20th of 2022. And I remember that date specifically. It was like a it was a Tuesday night. I live an hour oh like an hour and fifteen minutes away, bro. I'm driving to her house, bro. Came go- boyfriend and girlfriend. It was like a month, bro. And we're dude, like it was like this like cheesy Christian love. We're like, dude, like I'm so into you, bro. Like, dude, it was cheesy, bro. It was so corny, like Hallmark corny. Yes, dude, we were like Hallmark. <laughs> like, yes, corny. I did not like it, bro. <laughs> We were corny, bro. Oh, and your, uh, your wife loves Hallmark. Yeah, that's probably why. You're right. She's like, I'm living in a. That's see, that's why you wear so many darn cardigans. Because <laughs> she's on the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> Home for Christmas. Fell in love with my high school sweetheart. That's what it was too. Oh so, my bro, gosh. Like a month in, we're like, all right. Like I think I'm sold out for you, bro. Like you're my person, bro. April twentieth, we start dating as an exclusive couple. I thought it was twenty second. 20th. I said 20th. Did you say? April okay, 20th. Sorry. We're an exclusive couple. July 16th. We're engaged, bro. <laughs> we're engaged July 16th, bro. That's April, May, June, July. Two months in like three and a half weeks. We're dating and we're engaged. Yeah, bro. Christians. Mean Co- corny Christians, bro. Corny Christians. They're like, yeah, no. <clears throat> we, we know it. We know it. Dude, and so. <laughs> we're getting married. Bro, you just, dude. I've mentioned this to you, but let's talk about this for real. So we had planned our wedding to be February, like, 18th or something. Mm -hmm. Planning a wedding and all this. We're living an hour and 10 minutes apart. It's really difficult, bro, like, being a Christian and being an hour and 15 minutes apart and trying to follow Jesus. At this point in our lives, we started... Be real and honest here. We started, like, kind of giving in to some some temptations, bro. Are you telling me you guys had sexual contact before... Marriage. That's what I'm saying, man. <laughs> um, now, don't take this lightly for listeners. Like, yeah, this no. is, no, like, it's it's not something we're proud of. Mm-hmm. It's wrong. Any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage, holy matrimony, is wrong, and it's sinful, and it, and it, it cost us. Oh, it, it does. It cost us, bro. Let me A tell you something. Things. Do I have your permission, Riley, to go into detail here? We had sex outside of marriage for months. And it was so detrimental to us. We like we almost walked away from our faith, straight up. Like not to the point of like I'm walking away from the church, but like we started having sex outside of marriage. We stopped diving into our word. We stopped with our prayer life. We started listening to secular music again. We're like, dude, maybe like I kind of want to pick up a vape again. Like all these things, bro. And I remember the day, bro, that it was rough. I, maybe you remember this, babe. I was like, Riley, we can't keep doing this. Like, this is this is not what God designed for us. Like, I'm not doing this. I'm not staying late at your house anymore. Like, we were, like, even, like, staying the night together. So wrong. Come Christians, don't do it. Don't stay at their house when you know it's dark out and you know their parents are asleep and you know you have the privacy. Flee from the sexual there temptation, we are. I was bro. About to say, I was wondering if Full you were going to do it. Full circle. Don't try to resist because yeah. I tried to resist. Me, me and her made this covenant, bro. We're like, we're, every time we have sexual desire, we're going to read our Bibles. We're going to separate from each other and go pick up our Bibles. It lasted two weeks, bro. Two weeks. And on week number three, it was no more than no more than a month after we made that pact, we were having sex. Right. Don't try to resist. Let me Let me say this. Look at, dude. Don't try to resist. Flee the temptation. Don't put yourself in that position. Because we were sold out for Jesus. And we love him. But we're not stronger than that temptation. And we were young and immature in our faith. And so we had sex outside of marriage, and it killed us. It killed us, and it really hurt our sexual intimacy in marriage. Right. And for the first... Dude, in all honesty, like, let's be real. The first, like, year of our marriage, like our sex life was so unhealthy because we tried to experience it in our own way, not in God's way. Right. And it it hurt us, man. It hurt us. 
And I'm saying all this to say that we realized we were wrong. We were like, we cannot keep living this way. Mm -hmm. So we went about a, mm, three weeks, I would say. Three weeks, we stopped spending the night together. We stopped staying late together. We were doing good and purity. And we're trying to plan a wedding. We're trying to follow Christ. We're doing all of these things. And we're like, this kind of sucks, dude. Like, this is, this is not fun. Like, I want to, you're my person. I know I'm going to spend my life with you. Like, what are we doing? Bro, we loped. We got married on a Tuesday stinking night. We were supposed to get married on February 18th, right? And that would have been, hold on, August, September. Eight more months of yeah. that situation, of that difficult distance, resisting and fleeing the temptation, planning a wedding, pursuing Christ, all this stuff. Now, hear me. I'm not telling you this is for everyone. I'm not telling every Christian couple to go elope. That's not what I'm saying because it was hard, so stinking hard to do that because we literally, in a matter of three weeks, we're like, we're struggling with sexual immorality. We're not following Jesus to... We're breaking off those bondages in our life. We're not giving into that anymore. We're pursuing Christ, and we're like, "Do you know?" Oh, like we asked, we're, we sat on her bed. We were like, "I was like Riley, do you know that God has created me to spend the rest of my life with you?" She said, "Yes." She said, "Do you feel the same? Like, am, are you supposed to spend the rest of your life with me?" I said, "Yes." And so, literally, the an, a week later, we got married. We went to the church with her grandpa and her grandma, who were, were our pastors at the time. It was a Tuesday night, bro. They wrote up our vows. We stood in that. We went and got, I left work early. I, I got with my boss. I left work early, went to the courthouse, got the certificate. We stood in that sanctuary with me and her and her grandparents who are, are also our pastors. They married us. And we went to Texas Roadhouse with her mom and we got food and we went back that night and we consummated the marriage, bro. <laughs> praise God. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> no, hold on. Hold on. No, I'm hearing you, man. Yes, praise God. But... When we thought that moment was going to be, and we haven't had this super conversation, it wasn't what we thought it was going to be right. because we'd already been having sex for two months. We're like, wait, bro. Like this was supposed to be like trumpets and angels and oh my gosh, holy matrimony. We're intimate, bro. No, it wasn't because we tried to do it on our own first. So we got married. We struggled for a year with intimacy. Um, and now... Where we're at now, we went through that season. We got married. We got this tiny little blue house, bro. Oh, my gosh. This house was the size of this room, bro. Like, it was a shack. It's rough. We're fighting all the time. She was really in a season of, of really bad mental health. She struggled with depression. And by the grace of God, by the power of God and the Holy Spirit, she is on the top of this, this battle. She is, has a sword in her hand, and God is delivering her from this depression. I praise God for that. I'm proud of you, babe. I'm just going to give her a little shout-out. Um. But it was hard, dude. It was so hard. We went from living an hour and a half apart and living in sin to like learning how to coexist and be married and honor God and have sex in a holy way and, and, and love each other and surrender. I was a horrible husband, bro. I was a piece of garbage husband. Like so bad, bro. And Riley's like, you know, like some, whatever. You're like, oh, no, you don't. No, like I sucked. Like I was, I sucked. I was not doing my part. I, tr I was trying. I thought I was. But all of this to say, man, God used those situations, though, to shape us yeah. into who we are now. And, and you know, here we are. Um, close, yeah, close to, to just two years later, man. Um, and we're the healthiest we've ever been. And I know that we're only going to get healthier from this point. And we have, God willing, 35 more years together. Hopefully, actually, Jesus comes back before then. <laughs> but, yo, listen, bro. Um, I'm saying all of this. I'm being super raw with you to tell you that, bro, being a Christian is not going to be easy, man. Um, I thought that when I gave my life to Christ and I was, you know, I, I turned away from that lifestyle, I was just going to have this easy sailing. It's not, it's, bro. It's so hard. And But but Riley and I have grown. And um, God showed us pretty quickly that he has a call for us to be in ministry. And I really believe with my whole heart that that's why we got married so quick. That's why we took the path we did. It's not everybody's path. It's not what everybody will do. It's not what every Christian couple will do. And most Christian couples probably won't because um, it's just hard, bro. <laughs> it just sucks. It's difficult. Um, 
<laughs> it wasn't traditional. It was weird. I'm going to be real. My, go ahead, John. Well, I don't want to cut you off. Um, but I just want to, I want to hopefully maybe help you. Uh, Cause yeah, you're right. I need your help. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love you. I'm just gonna, I'm going to be real, bro. Like, want to help you <laughs> yeah it is hard and yeah it it does suck sometimes and yeah it may not be conventional it may not be the norm but i'm a big promoter for one just glorifying god and and living for god <clears throat> unfortunately within our culture we have uh built this we covered it in Asia's episode, uh, actually, a couple episodes back of when uh, we were talking about marriage to where it's like we make this big thing out of marriage and we completely forget what it's about. I don't think God cares all that much about the huge party or all that. Like, he just wants us to be right. He wants us to listen to him. And you, that's what you, I mean, it might not have been conventional. It might not have been romantic. It might not have been a Hallmark movie. But she you got our Hallmark movie though. We'll talk about it later. Okay, but don't discredit it. No, what I'm getting at though is it might not be conventional, and sometimes in life we don't do what everybody else does. But isn't that the Christian Christian walk? Isn't that what this whole faith journey is about? Is like doing stuff that maybe the world doesn't do, and that looked what that looked like for you guys was sitting on your bed and being like, "Hey, listen, we're struggling with this." And I'm not I'm not saying that if you're struggling with with temptation and sex and lust and all these things that, oh, no, let's just get married. It'll fix it. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is. What it looked like for you was that you both wanted to honor God, you wanted to honor each other and you wanted to to make things right. So you're like, hey, why wait? Why wait? Why are we waiting? Like, let's just get married. Let's do it. <clears throat> and y'all, y'all got married. And then you had, yeah, you had an actual mar uh, actual ceremony later. Mm -hmm. And I, dude, I'm a big supporter for these types of things. Like, if you know what you want, and you might not have every detail figured out, you don't know what it's gonna look like. But I'm pretty sure God's word says, I He works all things out to the good of those who love Him. And if you love God and you're doing things because you love God, he will honor you because you're honoring him. And no, it's not going to be easy. And it is going to be hard. And maybe you might have put yourself in a situation where you kind of brought lust into the marriage bed because you thought, okay, once we sign our names on the dotted line and now we're married, it'll be angels and harps. And I don't even think that's biblical, by the way. No, that was but, just my, that was <laughs> no, my thought. My <laughs> But but no, I'm I'm hearing you. Like you, we think that it's going to be all good and grand uh, once we're right with God. But realistically, bro, and I know some people might take this wrong. Um, I don't care. I'm gonna say it this way. God teaches us how to do life. He teaches us how we're kids, and we have to learn from our parents. Right? God's our heavenly Father. And I'm just going to say it. He has to teach us things in life. Sex is one of those things. Being intimate with your significant other, your wife, your husband, your spouse, who you have committed yourself to for life, who you have said vows. This isn't just a, oh, boyfriend, girlfriend thing. No, who you stood at the altar with in front of God and you laid your life down and said, I'm, I'm, I'm committing my life to this person. And now you guys are married. He teaches you how to be intimate. And, dude, it's crazy you say that because in the Bible, there's no dotted line. Nope. Bro, there's no, there's no signing of a contract. There's no marriage license. There's no going to the courthouse. What marks that marital covenant between a man and woman is sex. Bro, I'm so happy Bro. you said it. So listen. Come on. Because what's sex? What? Or what, what? what is marriage? It's a covenant, right? It's a covenant, man. It's not just a contract. It's a covenant. And, and how, so, do you, how do you, how do you uh, finish a covenant or, or, or covenant? Or how do you uh, commit to a covenant? There has to be a what? Do you know? No, I don't know where you're going it's with It's a this. shedding of blood. 
Yes. Okay. Like at the altar. Yes. Yes. Like, like the covenant. The, that like we made at with the, the land. altar. The right. same thing biologically. Oh, dude. This is crazy because I know where you're going now, bro. Biologically, when you have sex, we all know a woman. Uh, what's what's the word for it? I don't want to get it wrong and sound so ignorant. Um, there is a layer of skin that gets broken. The hymen. The hymen. Yeah. Thank when you. you have so sex sorry. For the first time. Yeah, yeah. So when a woman has sex with a man, their hymen is broken, and that leads to a shedding of blood. That shedding of blood is a covenant. Is a covenant. God created sex to be a covenant, and it's not to be done with anybody but one person. So when you have sex with a person, you are in covenant. You are married with this person. Right. Like that's how God created sex to be like that's why it's so powerful because you are attached to this person. And that's where we lead and that's where we have issues within life and culture and all these all these things when we're out here just treating it like it's it's it shouldn't be in high regard when it should be. Bro, and so like if you think about it uh, John, man, we're just bouncing over here because we we got the same brain, bro. Like, think about how many people. You no, know, I'm gonna say you and I because I know you. Mm -hmm. and I know me. Think about how many people we got married to before we met these women. I don't want to, <laughs> but, but I hear. The, listen, that's the truth, bro. I, listen, bro. If if I could change, if I could turn back time, bro. You're like, not bro, a singer, bro. I'm Keep so, stick with the pod, bro. Listen, I regret, bro, because not we made covenants. saving myself. For my wife. Exactly. Because when Riley and I signed that contract, if if you know, if we think about it from a, a biblical standpoint, we we'd already been married. Yeah. Because we, we tried to make that covenant mm -hmm. in our own terms. Mm -hmm. We tried to have that sexual on your own intimacy time. on our own terms, on our own time, in our own way. That's not how God told us that we're supposed to do it. So when you know we signed that dotted line, we thought it was gonna be all, all fine and dandy. Like you said, we brought lust into the marital bed. And, it, it, dude, it's taken a year for us to process through these things and learn these things. And and I will say, man, for all the people, you know, if you're listening to this and you, and you maybe you're, like, offended by this. Maybe you, you are hearing this and you're like, well, I've been having sex outside of marriage and I don't feel that way. I don't feel convicted. I don't feel bad about it. It's not about what you feel and think. It's about what God says. At the end of the day, the truth of the matter is, whether you feel convicted about it or not, it's wrong. I didn't feel bad at first about smoking dope and doing coke, but it was still wrong. And so with my marriage, man, dude, it, it made it so difficult. But like you said, God has to teach us as, as a father teaches their sons and daughters Man, you need to give that to God. Yeah. God created that covenant in such a way to unite two people. Bro, let's get super raw here for a second, bro. Dude, like, Christians make it weird. Oh, come on. About <laughs> sex, bro. Bro, <laughs> yeah. like, dude, I'm about to out myself. Not even out myself. I'm just going to be just raw, bro. Bro, like, before getting intimate with my wife, I pray every time. Every time I thank God. I thank God. God, thank you for this woman. Thank you for creating her exactly the way that she needed to be created. And thank you for creating me exactly the way that I need to be created. I want to honor you with this woman. I want to honor you with this covenant. And like, bro, if I were to say that to, you know, I'd say a good majority of Christians are like, bro, you talk to God before you have sex. Yeah, bro. Before and after. And then, and then, 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 then two days later, I'm like, God, thank you for that, bro. That's for real. No, nah, listen, I'm listen, being so man. real, bro. I'm with it. God with created it. it. God, I'm listen, so bro. With it. Listen to me, bro. God, Lude, let's think about this. <laughs> God on. created your body and put your 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 glands. He put all of your your um you can nerves. Say he created your genitals. Yes, bro. He put your nerves in the end of your genitals where they were supposed to be, so you could enjoy sex with your wife. It's bro. a covenant. He wants you to enjoy it. God created her body to 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 feel pleasure from your intimacy. So tell me, why is it weird to surrender that to Him? It's so not. when we're on, dude, like when you're in that sexual int intimacy within the context of biblical marriage, bro. Give it to God. You Maybe you're a Christian and you've been married for 10 years and you're like, why is my intimacy not getting better? Well, are you giving it to God, bro? 
Are you surrendering it? I didn't beat my pornography addiction on my own. I gave it to God. I didn't I didn't beat my bitterness and anger on my own. I still struggle with that sometimes, but I'm not doing it on my own. I'm giving it to God. Why would I expect my sex life to get better if I'm not giving it to God? He created your genitals, dude. Surrender it to him. Like let's be let's not even being funny here, man. No, I got you, bro. Just like, Why are we I not love doing the freedom this? in this room right bro, now? It's crazy because we like we want to hide these things from God. It's like, oh my, I can't talk because it's like we think of God as like, oh, like when I can't sit down with my parents and say this. It's like, okay, but God created you, bro. God knows, like He already knows how you feel. He knows. Mm -hmm. He made that covenant, bro. Unpopular opinion. <laughs> And I'm going to set the stage for this. <clears throat> when God created man and woman, he created Adam, right? He created Adam. And then from the man, he created the woman. So he looked at these two. So God said they looked at man and said it's not, not right for man to be alone, all one, alone, okay, all one. So he separated the man into two parts, man and woman. When those two come together in his structure— that those two beings become one person again. They are attached to each other spiritually. So you see God's image. Why? Because man was created in God's image. He said, Come let on. us create man in God's <clears throat> image. And then from that man, he created a woman. So when the man and the woman come back together within the structure of his biblical marriage, he sees himself. Bro, God is up there just like, yeah, bro. Let's go. Get it. And like, Riley's over here making yourself. a face, bro. Like, Dude. But that's the freedom. Listen, that's the freedom we don't talk about when it comes to sex. Because in a lot of ways, we're still stuck in that sinful, lustful, weird mind state of sex is bad. Yeah, this and commercialized I shouldn't do you. It. Dude, like literally, like when I was growing up, it's don't do, don't have sex. It's bad. So... A lot of us never grow out of that mind state. We carry that into a biblical marriage, even though now God approves of it. But now I'm stuck in this whole like, oh, no, it's a bad thing. No, it's a good thing. If you are committed to Christ and you guys are in love with each other and you're married and you guys are having sex, guess what, bro? You're glorifying God. Amen. I, I, people might not agree with this, but this is my opinion. I don't care if you agree or not. Sex is a form of worship. Amen. Go have that sex worship session, bro. Sex is a form bro. of worship, 100%. I mean, it's only weird when you make it weird. Like, I'm just saying, like, you said you pray during, you pray after. or you Like, come on, bro. Come on. Like, we are intimate. Like, I'm not sitting here. Like, don't make it weird. Yeah, like don't said, make it weird. It's weird when you make it weird when you're like, uh, God's in the room or like, bro, uh, he's like watching no, us. stop it. Like, listen, we're glorifying God with our bodies. He said, or what's what? Oh, what's that scripture? Um, live lives of worship. You yeah. are to live a life of worship. Mm -hmm. Guess what we're going to be doing in life? I'm going to be having sex with my wife. Amen. I am. Why? Because one, she's gorgeous. And two, God made her and made her for me and I'm married to her. So I'll be darned if I ain't going to glorify God in my marriage and worship my God in my marriage. It's a form of worship. And it's only weird when you don't, or when you make it weird, bro, <laughs> I wish we need everybody in a real room. Oh People my just gosh, need to hear it, man. bro. I, somebody was set free there. I'm, I, I have a little bit more freedom there, dude. This is yeah. Bro. 100%. All right. So I'll tell you what, man, when Riley and I, you know, so this is something that we, we aren't like extremely vocal about in our communication. We talk about it, and then, you know, we kind of just we just act it out and live it out. Because something that my wife struggles with is like expressing feelings and you know communicating right. on topics like this. So when we came to this realization together, man, and we just started worshiping God, man, listen. Not only did our sex life get better, but our marriage is healthier. No way. We can communicate better. What? I'm not as bitter. Oh no. She's not as short. She. I know it's like it's Surprise. crazy to believe, but when we started honoring God in how he created us to be and seeking him individually, and then when we come together to seek him, our whole marriage is flourishing, man. Yeah. And God is really showing us that, hey, I've called you guys to a life of ministry. 
I need you to walk in my ways so that you can advance the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to kind of round back to the testimony a little bit. Um, yeah. Man, where we're at right now, bro, let's start talking about us. All right. So listen, bro, here, hold on. Before we get into it, because one of the things that I want to talk about, listen, bro, we're already to like two and a half. Is this too hours. long, bro? Can bro you? No. What are you talking about? The freedom in this room. If you're cool to sit, I'm, I'm here. This We're going to go for a record. If somebody gets to this point in the episode, I love you. I we love probably you. are like close to three. Oh, bro, right I don't now. care if it takes you a week to finish this episode. Um, We're not going to go a week, but I'm saying Riley's the freedom in home, this bro. room, I am not stopping this. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I'm digging. Um, But I want to make sure that... uh. We we talk about one topic specifically it, because I already I kind of have a feeling where we're going with uh, oh, us gosh. talking about us. So one of the reasons why I believe that one I just agree that everybody has something that they can offer, and one of the things that I believe that you have to offer is your perspective on being a young Christian male with biblical traditional morals and perspective on being the head of your household and working in your job we all right so you okay, see just ask me bro, questions and let me bro, answer listen you're a blue collar worker right you got a nine to five right i mean it's not a nine to five it's a six to four but yeah but talk about it because i know that's your what field. are we talking about bro what do we what do you want to know like because here's what i'm saying like i i kind of feel where you're going with this but I, just ask me questions and let me answer them because i want you to pry at me so i can give you what you need i got you so is working a job biblical oh my gosh yes working a job bro let me talk about paul for a second so so, um, you know, I got a dude, no names. I'm not going to drop no names. A dude in my life who he's like, bro, I'm called to be a Paul, bro. I'm called like, and dude is just, he just wants to like travel around house hop. He's a musician. He does gigs and shows, right? He's scraping by and making, not only making a lot of money. Like this man has a heart for the Lord. Yeah. He's a, he loves Jesus Christ and he's following Jesus Christ. But he's like, I'm called to be a Paul, bro. I'm called to, you know, be a vagabond, bro. Paul worked a full-time job. Let me tell you something. Paul was a tent maker. Okay. And Paul was one of the biggest missionaries that there ever was. He traveled around the like all of the Eastern Hemisphere, bro, planting churches, shepherding churches. He discipled people. He trained people. But you know what he did? He worked a 40-hour work week. Come on. Bro, because as Christians, we think, like, here's the stigma, bro. Like, when, we, when we're Christians and, like, we, you know, kind of get into this— ministry lifestyle bro we're like bro i just want to be full-time ministry bro i just want god to bless me i can be full-time ministry i don't want to go to this nine to five bro every single apostle disciple that walked with jesus worked the nine to five bro paul was a tent maker he saw this this means of provision in front of him bro he's like bro i needed a shelter and so i built myself a tent hold on other people need tents too bro so he started building other people tents and he made a job out of it. He saw a means of provision in front of him, and he said, I have a skill that I can go work a job to provide for my ministry. Come on. Let me go do it. Paul did not say, let me go to church on Sunday and take up an offering so I can go across the country on a mission trip. He said, I'm going to go. God, it says that we are to work in a way that make the teaching of Jesus Christ appealing and attractive. Mm -hmm. It says in the book of Timothy that we are to work with our hands and yep. be diligent. Yep. God calls us to work. Here, look, here's like the, bro, I'm about to just drop a bomb really quick. People think that work is like part of the fall, right? Listen, bro, let's go to Genesis. God said that when you till the ground, it's going to work against you. Yep. You're, you're called to till the ground and be fruitful. It's going to work against you. And people are like, oh, like, so the fall of this fleshful world, this sinful world is work. No, it's not. Before the fall, God called us to work. God called us to multiply, be fruitful, and subdue the earth. Subdue have means... Have dominion over it. Have dominion over it to make it fruitful in a way that it benefits us. To Come work on. in a way that it makes your life fruitful. So before the fall of our fleshful nature, before the fall of humanity into sin, God called us to work. God... God is not punishing us with work. He called us to work before the fall. But when the fall happened and sin entered the world, 
Then God said, in your work, the ground will work against you. So working is not a, a part of the fall. It's not part of our punishment. Right. Working is something that God called us to do in the beginning of time. Come on, sir. And so... Can I add something? Go ahead, bro. Bro, I got to. Yeah, work was for before the fall. We had jobs. After the fall, your job's going to be hard, and you're probably not going to like it. Bro, Yes. That's it. Literally, you want you want a dumbed down version? Like that's what it was. You had a job before the fall. Come Your on. words had power and the world listened to you. Like listen, if like in context, like if God created us in his image and when he spoke, things happened. What do you think happened when Adam spoke? Things happened. So when we fell, our words did our, our words didn't hold weight. The world right. didn't listen to us any longer. Dude. So then that made us that made us have the sweat of our brow. Amen. That means we had to break our backs to work, and now it's hard, and we don't like it. That's sin. Bro, take it up with the devil. Oh my bro, and so the Christians have this mindset, bro, of like, I want to be full-time ministry. I, 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 wanna, I don't want to have to go to my 9 to 5. Bro, your 9 to 5 is your ministry. Bro, tell me why Christians think that going and working a job, bro, listen to this. You think Paul was like, I'm going to go make these tents. And when he was making those tents, he never talked about Jesus. He never talked about the gospel. He's like, I'm going to make these tents. I'm going to put my head down. I'm not going to talk. And I'm, and then when I'm done with my nine to five, I'm going to go to the church building and I'm going to talk about, no, bro. At this time, church buildings were like not even a thing. At this time, they're traveling around. They're meeting in houses. They're going to their nine to fives. And at their nine to five job, they're surrounded by broken people who need Jesus. And they're like, hey. Dude, you want to talk about this guy I know? Jesus. Their ministry was their work. If you're a Christian, no part of your life is separate from your ministry. Your life is your ministry. So when you go work in your blue-collar job, I'll, I'll, I'll talk in that field because that's what I know. When I go to work in a blue-collar field and, and build these high-precision million-dollar machines surrounded by guys who are vulgar and gross and angry and bitter— you think that's not a mission field? You think those men don't need Jesus? Bro, and it took me so, it was just like a hard rude awakening for me to realize like, bro, like God might never call me out of a nine to five job. Odds are he probably won't. And if he does, praise him. But if he doesn't, the Bible says to work in a way that makes the teachings of Christ honorable. So I guess for me being, um, you know, a blue collar worker, dude, work, work is not the fall. Work is not a punishment. God called you to work, bro, and you should work in a way that make his teachings attractive. Didn't Jesus have a job? Oh, bro, Jesus Are we literally supposed to isn't here our example. Didn't Jesus have a job? Bro. I'm sure it wasn't a hobby. I'm sure he didn't just like playing with wood. Nah, like, bro. He no, was like, fam, he nah. had a job. He had a job. He, he was our had best to example. Provide. He he knew what it was. And why would God why would God take you out of a place where the broken is? Why would he take you out of the place where the broken is? If, if right. there are people in your job who need Jesus, who need freedom, who, who need deliverance, sounds like you're the light in the darkness. Amen. If you choose to be, that's the thing. There it is. You can't, you can't, it, our faith should not be marginalized. You can't, you can't make, um, you can't make compromise. That's where I'm going with this. You can't make compromise. You can't go to work and be like, well, Dude, these 50-year-old dudes are like super vulgar and they're super strong-headed and they're just going to make fun of me because I'm a Christian, so I'm just not going to talk about it. Ah, wrong. Jesus did not call you to hide your faith, bro. You're going to get made fun of. Come on. End of story. You're going to get made fun of. You're going to be weird. You're going to get picked on. Bro, John Hinton put me on game. God is weird because weird means extraterrestrial, supernatural. You're going to be weird if the Holy Spirit is living within you. People are going to pick on you. Yeah. But God didn't say to go and live an easy life. He said, you're going to suffer for my name. And so if you try to separate the gospel in your, in your work, man, yeah. You're going to get yeah, exhausted, keep, fam. I guess I don't know where you, where you want me to go with this, man. Keep no, asking I got me you. questions. No, it's just mainly it. Like, I, I think you covered a lot of it, but I'm saying that's the main thing right there is because – so let me just put in the little context that I see you're a young man who has made mistakes just like anybody else, you came to know who Jesus was. Like you knew who Jesus was or you knew about him, and then you experienced him. Right. Life got flipped, turned upside down. 
<laughs> I, How? Really, I, I, really want, I really want to continue that. I'm not going to do it. No, I'm just saying, your life got flipped upside down, right? And you started living for Jesus. And living for Jesus includes being a Christian in the working field. A work field? Working field? Mm-hmm. Like, it's a field in which you need to plant seeds, water yes, those sir. seeds, wait for the harvest, and be there ready, expecting... Not living two different lives, not going to, and not to correct you, but they did have temples back then, but not just to go to God's house and worship on a Sunday and hang out. And then once you leave those doors, go back and just do what you want to do with your life. Cause we have a lot of Christians out here. I get it. I fell into the trap as well at one point in time in my life. And it's still waiting at my door every day to just live a double life. But no, God doesn't want the 1% of your week and the hour and a half that you spend at church and then the moment that you leave the house or you leave his house to go do your thing and do Come what on. you want to do with your life. That's not what this whole this whole faith or this whole life is about. It's literally about living a life of worship, something that brings glory to God and to do things in a manner that when people look at your life, when they see you, they see you as the church. You're not just a person that goes to church, but you are the church. Come on. Bro, if if somebody never reads the Bible in their life and you're the closest thing to Jesus they ever see, they better read what Jesus wrote. Bro, you can't walk out Ooh, of his house. And it better be written on your skin. Dude, you can't walk out of the house of Jesus Christ better be written on and your not character. be the light of the world. Bro, and the thing is, too, like I also want to kind of hit on this. Bro... And Paul also said in Timothy, like, don't let anybody anybody despise you because you're young, man. Yeah. Like, be be an example because mm-hmm. you're young, bro. Look, I'm 20, and look, I'm about to just, I'm about to just put it out there and be vulnerable, not you know for like a, a pity party, like, oh look at me, but it just lets you be raw here, bro. Like, I'm I'm 21. I work 45 hours a week in in a manufacturing plant, blue collar job. I'm learning to be a husband. We're diving into ministry. I just finished. And, you know, my first step of, of ministry school cams, um, you know, we're learning to serve at a higher capacity. Um, even, you know, like just work, even working a second job, or I, I'm picking up a part-time job working in the evenings, a couple of nights a week. Um, and I'm saying all of this to say, like, all of these things, like, could be perceived as like, oh, it's just too much. And like, it's just the enemy trying to get at me. And I have so much on my plate, bro. Like, that's what you are called to do. Like in the midst of all of this, I still have to seek God. I still have to make time for his word. I still have to surrender to him. I still have to be in prayer. And and I'm 21, bro. And it sucks because a little for a little while I was like deceived, man. I'm like I'm young. Like I'm not I'm not worthy. Like I can't do this. I'm 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 young, dude. Like I'm just a little baby kid. Like I can't I can't do this. I can't work a job. I can't, you know, be an example. I can't, but you can though, bro. You can. Like I have a guy at work, um, and I, I ran into the wife about this. I get frustrated. I was lucky enough to have a dad who set the example of what it means to work hard. My, mm-hmm. dad, my dad's a hard worker. He always has been. He's always working. And so like I take pride in my work, especially as a follower of Jesus Christ, because the word says work in a way to, that make the teachings of Jesus Christ attractive. Mm-hmm. So when I'm at work, like I want, I take pride in it. I want to do my best. I want to give my hundred percent. And I'll have a guy that you know, there's a specific guy I'm working with. Like he just wants to be very lazy, bro. Just wants to drag, drag his balls all day and not do anything productive and just be, you know. And like that's not me, bro. And so like, do you know how hard it is to have a 40 year old man who is being super lazy and not wanting to work, and me being a 20 year one year old kid who this this guy's literally my dad's age. Like I said, I have young parents. <laughs> And I have to be like, hey, bro, like, can we can we work? Like, let's let's get this done, bro. Like, why why wait and push this off to the mo- just these small things, man? Like, don't let people discourage you because you're young. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't be an example of Christ. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't take on a lot if the Holy Spirit is your power, man. Yep. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't be a husband. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't run a podcast, bro. It doesn't, <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no, I hear you, bro. Bro, it doesn't matter if you're. It doesn't matter how old you are, bro. It also doesn't matter if you're 50 and you just gave your life to Christ. The same applies, bro. It doesn't matter your age, bro. How old was King David? When Samuel spoke to him, Pastor just talked about it this morning. Uh, he was a young boy. Yeah, he was a young boy. He was like 14 years old. When he was in the field and, and, and the, the prophet Samuel said, you're going to be king one day. 
He was 14. Like, could you imagine? That? He was like 16 when he slayed Goliath and led armies, <clears throat> excuse me, into battle. He was like 16 when he killed Goliath. Bro, what? It don't matter how old you are. I was playing Xbox at 16. Yeah, right, bro. What I'm, you still, mean? I'm, I'm still playing the Fortnite, bro. I'm not going to lie. I'm still on it. <laughs> but yeah, no, I got you. Like, it doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter your age. If you're striving towards purpose... Towards Jesus, man. Towards and the world's Jesus. Go, the world's gonna want to tell you you're young, dude. Just go live your life. Oh you're so young. You don't you don't know what love is. Why are you getting married? You're so young. You're so young. Go experience. Go out and party. But and you're like, but and you're 19. And you're like, but wait, but I, I don't want that though. Don't let the world deceive you, bro. No. And I'm not saying that a person. Listen, a disclaimer. I'm not saying a young person should get married. Yeah, I'm also not saying that either. Listen, no, I got to slide that in there real quick. We're not jumping back on marriage, but I'm saying that marriage is definitely something that needs to be held in high regard. So you don't do it just flippantly. You're not just out here. So if you're young, wait. <laughs> wait till you find the right one. Um, and then understand that everything after that can change. Like life changes. People change. People grow. And But it's it's, yeah. But no, I hear you, man. And it's, how do you feel? Let me get your opinion real quick. When it comes to, because you're a blue collar worker, you work about 45 hours a week. Um, because we got a new generation out here who are smart. And I'm, I'm a big supporter and just work smarter, not harder. And I'm not saying everybody needs to break their back for a buck. But if you can get a job done, I think work looks like a lot. Of, it looks different to everybody. Um, what's your, what's your opinion on that? Man. Oh man. Cause you could like, listen, there's people out here on YouTube Bro, getting paid to do a podcast. I, would you I consider do that? Would you consider this. that to be work? Because listen, man, a hard realization I had to make was like, not everybody takes the path I took. Facts. Not everybody goes to trade school and gets a really nice job at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So like, I'll look at people that I went to school with. And, like, they're my age or two years older than me, brother, like, 23, 24 years old. And, like, they're still, like, they're, like, you know, working these, like, where they're working 10 hours a week part-time. And they're doing, they're, like, not doing much with their life. And, now, granted, some of these are some secular people who don't know Jesus. But I'll look at them, and the Holy Spirit, dude, like, had to kick me in the face, dude. And was, like, not everybody's story looks like yours. Come on. So I, I do want to acknowledge that God not might have called you to go work in, in the trades. God not might have called you to go break your back and get your hands dirty. Because at the end of the day, like not everybody's made to work the job I work. I tell you right now, I am not made to make content. <laughs> I am not made to push papers and I am not made to be a car shell. Like that's just how I am. Right. God wired me. Like that's what I know. Like I, I got my first job in a machine shop when I was 16 and I was working like eight hours a day and going to high school all while smoking weed and doing like all these, you know what I mean? Right. Like all these things to like, <laughs> like work is just in, kind of ingrained in me. Like I've had a job since I, like before I even had my license. So like, that's just me, man. Like, that's just my personality. Like I feel wrong if I don't work a lot. And that's just me. That's just the example I had set. That's the, 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 what I saw, man. And that's what, what I know. Like it's, it's my heart and desire for my wife to like be able to stay home with our kids one day and, and take care of my babies. And like, if I have to work 60 hours a week, okay, cool. Like that's something that I think of. And that's just me. That's not everybody, man. Right. And maybe you're hearing this and you're like, bro, I struggle to work 30 hours a week. Look, I'm that guy. <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it this I'll way, work, but dang, <laughs> I don't, I don't understand what that feels like. I don't know that, but w your work doesn't look like my work. Mm -hmm. I will say though, People get so wrapped up in, I got to find a job that I'm passionate about, a job that I desire, a job that suits me. If that's the case, you're never going to find a job. You know why? Because um, there is a scholar at Harvard. Um, I, I forget her name, but it's on a podcast that I listen to. This is like a ver verbatim quote, but she did a study on people in their careers. And um, finding a, pat a career that you're passionate about is linked to people who have been in a career for six years plus. Mm. And where I'm going with this is the result that she found was passion comes after discipline. Passion comes after dedication. 
So you're going to become passionate about what you're doing as a job when you become good at it. When you know, maybe there's a couple other people in this company that can do what I do. Not in an arrogant way, but if you're just running around from job to job looking for like, oh, like this doesn't suit me. I don't enjoy it, bro. Like I don't enjoy going to work every day. I don't. At the end of the day, like I'm not saying I enjoy getting up and going to work every day. Now, I am very blessed to be in a field that I do find interesting and I am passionate about what I do. And that's a blessing. And that's not always the case. And I praise God for the fact that he put me where he put me. But there's been many months that I was, you know, in a department I didn't want to be in and it sucked, dude. Like I did, you know what I mean? But, it, mm-hmm. but you do it because you, you got to do it. You do it because you got to pay your bills. You do it because, and I'm speaking to husbands right now, because your family needs you to, man. Come on. You do it because you got, you got mouths to feed. And I'm not trying to be like cliche, like, Oh, you got mouths to feed. I got bills to pay, but you do though. Yeah, <laughs> you do. And you will become more passionate about your job when you remember that you're like, you're not even employed by Grobe. You're not employed by Best Buy. You're not employed by Crown Equipment. You're employed by the Heavenly Father. Come on, sir. So <laughs> everything you do should be for his glory. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody should go work a trade like I do. Right. I get it. And I will be honest and vulnerable. This is something that God's been working on my heart about. Because I, I, I had tendency to pass judgment. It's like, what? You can't work 30 hours a week, bro? What are you doing? All you do is... But then I'm like, wait... Not everybody's wired like me. And maybe that person really does struggle with that. My wife is a great example. I, this woman, she has a servant's heart. This woman sacrifices so much for me. But if she were to work a 40-hour-a-week job, she would be miserable mentally. She would have very poor mental health because God didn't design her to be a slave-laboring worker. It's not what God designed her to do. And so we've been blessed to you know find jobs that suit her, and she works you know X amount of hours a week, whatever, but... If she were to go work my job, we would have a horrible marriage, bro. We'd have a horrible marriage because she'd come home miserable and hate her life. Right. And, and maybe that's you hearing this. Like, if God didn't design you to work like that, this is something you got to flesh out with him, yeah. not me. I, I can't give you the answer to this, but what I can say is you're not always going to like your job, and it's not always going to be fun, but God called you to work, and you're going to become more passionate about it the more you surrender it. I think you just said it all, my guy. <laughs> well, bro, uh, we've had ourselves a time today. Yeah, man, we have. We, we're kind of all over the place. Bro, bro really, we are. A bunch of squirrels. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dude, <laughs> Goldfish he warned you. brains. John warned you. This is how it was going to be. I warned y'all. It, listen, if any of y'all made it to this, like, I don't care if it took you a whole week. If you made it to this point, we love you. And we're Seriously. proud of you. <laughs> because I'm going to be honest, sometimes I don't even like listening to myself, bro. bro. <laughs> I've posted, you know, like I'll like post something online and I'm like, how do people listen to this, bro? I don't like hearing myself, bro. Bro, so, bro listen, can I just be real? Like, I'm going to be honest. Like, sometimes I get pretty insecure about like the content that I do create because I have a good time and I truly believe that everybody has something to offer. I love stepping in the real room. And I love getting real. I love being relational, educational, authentic, and loving with every single person. And I love what God's created here. And I like to see the excitement on someone's face or like a comment that somebody randomly writes. And it's amazing. But sometimes I do get insecure about the content that I create because it's like it's not for everybody. Right. And the devil kind of usually works at that sometimes. And uh, like like our wives over here, we're sitting here trying to have a real conversation. Yeah, and, and they're, they're whispering laughing about at us. us. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's it, it's uh, it's definitely interesting. Um, I can't remember what you said that got me on that topic. But yeah, squirrel, no, we, squirrel. See, yeah, squirrel. There it is. Uh, yeah. Well, before you go on, I just want to encourage you, man, really quick, not to gas you up, but our wives are still rolling their eyes, bro. Um, you got, dude. You, you know. Insecurity can be a good thing in the aspect of be conscious about how you can grow, but man, like you do, you you do good. I know that I know that the podcast has uh, touched some people. It has touched my wife, man. Already, her is this ministry has has impacted her, bro, and the things that you've said on here. And um, yeah, I, I'm I'm honored to be on this podcast, bro. Thank you for like trusting me to hop on the real room, man, and just be here. So I know you get insecure, I do too, but keep it up, bro. You're doing good. Look at him. I should just let you do the outro. That's my dog. <laughs> Bro, no, seriously, let me take a minute to honor you and just thank you. Seriously, thank you. Um, 
I know you said you're not built to make content, but I know that you're built to share the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And that's in every form. Uh, I've definitely known you uh, for a little while now. And there's one thing that I know you won't do, and that's saying no to Jesus. So if there's an opportunity to bring glory to him, you're all for it. So I just thank you. I want to thank you for saying yes and coming on The Real Room today or stepping in the real room, sitting down and getting uh, transparent and vulnerable. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for being transparent. And just thank you for being a good friend, my guy. Yeah, like, bro. for real. I appreciate real. you. And I love you and your beautiful wife. You guys are an amazing, uh, I would say, addition to our lives. We Dude, love that's you. that's the truth, though, man. Life has been great since we became friends. Low-key, man. <laughs> God, God, God is good out here. Thank you, bro. I appreciate you. Bro, I love you. All right. And uh, everybody else, <laughs> we love you guys. And we want to thank you guys all for uh, stepping in the real room and getting real with us today. If this has uh, touched your life in any way or uh, if you're inspired or motivated in any way or you want to reach out to Jared uh, down there in the comments uh, or even in or down there in the comments, if if this is moved in your life in any way, please drop us a comment um please uh, i'm not gonna take you to like this video share it or subscribe i'm not that guy but drop us a comment we want to know if this if this moved in your life in some way and then second i will be dropping uh jared's social media uh information down in the description so if you want to reach out to him and and maybe just send him a personal message to say hey bro what you said about this specific topic really resonated with me and uh, i connect with you in a lot of or a lot um yeah, I just want to give you guys that opportunity to reach out to him. But here's my my least favorite part. We have to go. We have to leave. It's been three hours. It's been and and, and our wives go. are over there falling yeah, our asleep. Our wives are falling asleep. <laughs> but all right, everybody, we love you. Thank you so much for stepping in the real room and getting real with us. Until next week. Keep it real. <laughs>